The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of our own world and all the other galaxies out there, this is the Four Center and Other Center podcast feed. I'm Ken Naps. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw, and I'm happy to be here back in my own living room. Uh, talking mm. to Ken, in, you're in your office, right? You're not in like Montana or something weird. I am in my office. Uh, it is getting hotter and hotter, uh, but uh, happy uh, to be in my, my home office. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I've been away from LA for a while. And it's just like, I, I just need to see a palm tree and lots of horns honking. I just, I need it. I need to be back <laughs> home. It's not for everybody, but uh, I love it. So I'm happy to be home. Uh, as always, we want to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash four center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. We will have a recommendation a little bit later, and it'll be exciting because we didn't discuss this recommendation. I just put one in here. <laughs> Uh, you have, if you have one, great. I, I'll I'll look one up while we're going on here. But uh, um, yes, uh, we, we you and I we're, we're getting back into the rhythm and finding a new rhythm at the same time. So it is really amazing. We're we're you know doing this uh, four center presents other center uh, experiment uh, out of need. We've talked about it a lot. Um, maybe we'll we're still getting a few questions, so maybe we'll we'll post something in in writing and in solid black and white, so people can really really see. Uh, don't want to necessarily re-explain ourselves every time, but we're doing this other center uh experiment out of necessity unnecessary experiment uh and then i've been traveling and it's it's just been a weird uh busy time um which seemed like a good way to segue into talking about our life adventures uh we started (laughs) on our our news show kind of our first show of the week having our, our star wars and life adventures and Oftentimes, those adventures would be, okay, I, I, I bought this, or I saw this, or I talked to this person about this. But they're also just uh, what's going on in our lives, which <laughs> really relates to other centers. So, uh, Ken, what were your life adventures this week? You know, uh, it has been um, trying to uh, make some headway in some other projects. I've been working this day job for a while, and I'm, I'm kind of currently without a contract, so I'm not working there right now. I'm waiting for it to be renewed, and I'm, you know... Pens down, not touching anything <laughs> while it works. But that allowed me to uh, get some other stuff going and really focus on the work I need to. And and that's been fun and fulfilling uh, and also challenging to push myself forward. I have a tendency to be like, all right, this this one thing is working pretty good in my life or career. So everything else is, I'll just play video games and eat some food. Like, I don't need to continue the momentum. And, and I know you and I talked before about, you know, we could be, we enjoy our relaxing times, but also we enjoy working and sometimes wonder who are we without working? At least I do. I don't want to speak for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, it's been fun to find the balance. And then um, just kind of a uh, uh, side note, I've been getting, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of documentaries overall, as people know, and we discuss a lot here. I've always been a fan of, of Ken Burns and his docs and, and it's not even fair to call them docs. I don't even, he doesn't refer to himself as a documentary filmmaker. He refers to himself as a filmmaker and, and in, in watching, I'm watching uh, finally 2000, um, what was it, 17? They were, he finally released the Vietnam War doc, which is 10 parts. Hmm. It took 10, years, took 10 years to make. And um, it's hard to watch. It's, 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 there's been a few episodes that have ended with me like literally holding my breath. It's, and um, It's a brutal it's, chapter of history. I mean. Yeah, yeah. And it's important to analyze that and important to look at it. But in, 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 in watching... The Ducks, um, and I've watched his for years in Civil War and, and baseballs. Uh, my my favorite one. Um, some of the Ducks he's executive produced, like The West, is is pretty valuable. Um, but I, I stumbled on a lot of his interviews, and I've seen him speak before. But his his interviews are are just inspired me. Um, the way he's very eloquent, um, very calm, very centered, but very passionate. Uh, uh, a very progressive person, what he believes, but. But just the way he looks at it, the way the why he's doing it, why he explains it, a lot of it ties into some of the deeper themes of of, uh, of the stuff we discussed on Force Center normally, and and it's been uh, fun to sit there. So I've been spending a lot lot while you've been traveling. I have been just watching Ken Burns interviews on, on YouTube <laughs> from all kinds of eras, uh, and and uh, I, I put a post out. I, I I saw I saw the Barbie movie, and and you know we're trying to be very careful of how we phrase our discussions around 
movies and TV shows out there. Uh, I was absolutely moved by it and, and thought it was a pretty powerful piece of art. And it just happened. I also that day was watching an interview with Ken Burns that I thought that had a, it synced up really nicely with mm. what I felt about art and why we have art and why dry facts and numbers are important. And you don't want to mess those up, but you want to, you're not manipulating the audience. You're connecting with your audience and, and getting the deeper themes across and our shared experiences is, is how a lot of these big ideas take, take root in our hearts and can change us or inspire us or move us. And, um, and that's all through art. And, and that's part of what has been the last few years for us at, at uh, Four Center and other center of, of how we discuss pop culture is, is we approach it in a very uh, distinct way for us, you know, but we are discussing it as art. We're giving it both the respect it deserves and the proper place in the world. And sometimes it's just silly space saga stuff, but it is what defines us. It, it, it is what makes us, it is what inspires us. And, and that's why we discuss it with care and discuss the ideas that are presented in, in these projects. And so it's all of it kind of syncing up, uh, to me, um, sitting down and, and having uh, chicken tenders, uh, a peach <laughs> peach soda of some sort, and watching um, what I thought was a fine piece of art for our times uh, that moved me, inspired me, and made me think. And um, that's kind of been my journey. So that that's my life adventures, Joseph. It's it, and I'll tell you what, it's been uh, it's been hard. I've been a little grouchy and grumpy lately, and I couldn't figure out why, other than it's also really hot and humid in LA, which is not normal <laughs> for us. Like humidity. Um, but ev every night I've been watching, you know, the, 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 it's a 10 part miniseries, the Vietnam thing and, and each one almost two hours. Good Lord. That's tough emotions. And <laughs> I have just been upset and sad la last couple of weeks. So it's been an interesting journey. Uh, while you've been uh, having your own journey, <laughs> I've been traveling <laughs> around the soul uh, from my couch. I was going to say that that's exactly what I was going to say. You have been on a journey. You've been traveling mm -hmm. through the soul of America right there on your couch with what were you saying? What? Peach what? Ice cream? Peach soda? I, I don't know. No, no, no. I, I go, there's a, the, the AMC in Burbank, which is now the, the popular theater around here. Um, has I think it's a Minute Maid, but it's like a peach something. <laughs> and I just get a large, every time I, you know, uh, went there for, for uh, Indiana Jones as well. And, and like, I just get the largest soda possible, the, the largest triple size, you know, 64 ounce cup. And I just fill it up with this peach <laughs> madness, whatever it is. And I sip all the way through the movie, quiet, yeah. quietly, quietly, quiet so, sipping. Yeah. That is great. Mm -hmm. There's so much about that that, we, that there, those are three episodes of Other Center we can have right there. Um, mm -hmm. And when the strikes are over, and and uh, we are talking about the work of struck companies again, uh, that uh, there's a movie that came out <laughs> <laughs> that's been number one at the box office, which I am just so excited to discuss. I think you and I were talking off air. If things mm -hmm. were going as normal, we we, we might have done a special episode of of Four Center <laughs> to talk yeah. about that film, which I'm I'm very anxious to. Uh, yeah, no, I've, I've been on a, a, a three state odyssey. Talked a little bit about it um, last week, but I was in Wisconsin uh, to uh, help with the celebration of life service uh, for my father in law. Uh, got to have some really nice time with uh with my in-laws with my family uh that was really nice and then flew straight from there to this uh, film festival in portland uh, which i've now memorized the 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 uh portland festival of cinema animation and technology um mm. where my short film the narrator uh was was playing um and i got to hang out a little bit with a with a buddy uh from minneapolis who lives in portland so that was nice but other than that i went from intimate family mm. healing coping <laughs> time uh to you are in a, a a different city um and you don't know anyone else at this festival you know mm. no one just jump in <laughs> uh, have fun it worked out it ended up talking to meeting some other filmmakers who were great and and saw a ton of different shorts and and features and it was all really great. I, I felt I felt really good about just um, values from the uh, the franchise that we normally talk about of mm -hmm. letting go of fear and just taking a step into the unknown, being in the moment, and you know, it, don't worry about the what ifs, and mm -hmm. and that gives you a lot of strength and, and grace when you free yourself from worrying about the what ifs. 
and mm-hmm. and had a bunch of great up and down adventures with like I would go out to an event and I would end up talking to a filmmaker and I'd have a great time and it'd be like, see, there's nothing to worry about. And then I'd go to the next event and be like, oh no, <laughs> you know, and go through the cycles of it. But it, it all uh, worked out really, really well. I don't know if you're familiar at all with the, um, with kind of the independent uh, uh, animator, Bill Plimpton. Does that name mean anything to you? Uh, I think it does, but I also might be confusing it with, with George Plimpton. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I saw one of his films in like the early nineties and he's just mm-hmm. like in, in uh, the, the, the sick and twisted animation festivals that used to tour yeah. different okay. cities uh, that would come through Minneapolis. Um, anyway, he gave a talk cause he, he uh, lives in Portland and showed some of his work and um, and his his life journey was uh, wanting to work for uh, the company that produces the work that we normally talk about, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. the one the, the mouse involved one, um, and telling a story of he had a breakout hit, weird, funny short that he didn't even submit it, but it got submitted for an Oscar and kind of the the an Academy Award and the, the world opened up to him and he told this story mm-hmm. of, you know, someone from the company came with like a briefcase and saying, we would like you to work for us, take a million dollars. And he's mm-hmm. like, here's my dream. My dream finally mm-hmm. happened. It came true. And then he's like, but so I started doing all this cause I wanted to work for you, but then I've made these little weird things that are just my own on the side. And that's why you're here. I, can I keep making those little weird things? Mm-hmm. And and the man with the briefcase said, of course, of course, please, we'll own them and decide whether or not to distribute them. But of course, mm-hmm. uh, it, and it was kind of just a testament to sort of um, the power mm-hmm. of, of following y- your gut and your instincts and your desires. And, and he mm-hmm. said, you know, it's to have no one looking over my shoulder and telling me what I can and can't do is worth more than a million dollars to me. And yeah, it was a great, simple turn of phrase, and obviously, we're not super anti-corporation here. That, that it's a reality. It's a reality, and and you know, you need a large platform to reach lots of people. But within that, that um, mm-hmm. that Lucas spirit, that uh, you mm-hmm. know, rebel in flannel of how do you accept the the realities of life and how much money it costs and and the power of reaching more people. How do you balance that with just this strong sense of good, bad, or otherwise? I want to make what I want to make, and mm-hmm. how do you how do you hold on to that? Uh, and, and this whole weekend was really refreshing for that perspective. Yeah, that's uh, that's the key. Yeah, I'm I'm with you too. Like I I I, I do believe there's a, a potential for, for people to sell out, and I think I have examples of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can point to it, but I've also a fought against that term um, because we have a system in which, uh, uh, you know, uh, money does does you well, you know, and and you want to get paid, you want to get compensated, and and if you want to reach people, you want to reach people, and and I, I've always kind of uh, br- bristled at the term sellout when it's used so casually mm-hmm. and, and easily, easily. If you look at the heart of the artist, I, I've talked music before. We talk music uh, here a lot, but like one of my favorite artists is, is Liz Fair, who in 1993 releases Exile on Guyville. She's completely independent. She's a lone woman in the Chicago music scene. She writes this album about that, this song for song resp- response to Exile on Main Street from the Rolling Stones. And she's an indie darling, right? And and then along the way, she, she, her style changes, the music changes, she finds herself changing. She has a son. She's uh, divorced. Uh, she starts. Um, she wants to do something a little different. So, two thousand three, she releases a self titled album that uh, had a little bit more pop to it. A lot of people will know this. Why can't I? The big single. She got ripped apart. Mm. She got ripped apart. But if you go to that album, that album is everything she wanted to do. Every mm. song is important for the time. Every song is a story of at the time a 36-year-old woman suddenly finding herself divorced and raising a kid and trying to find out what, what that means. It such, has such an artistic heart. But because she decided, yeah, I want to I want to write a catchier tune than my lo-fi <laughs> acoustic, acoustic guitar, my college dorm music, I changed. Uh, she got ripped apart for it and her career uh, almost never, I would say never really recovered into that mm. level. She to do a, a lot of scoring and she just released a great album soberish two years ago wrote a powerful memoir um that's great so anyways all that to say uh, to uh, i really respect number one what you're doing with with your um 
part right now, but also what we've done here and continue to do here at Force Center and Other Center. And um, we want uh, attention. We want views. We want clicks. We want we want money. Uh, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I, I want all of it. But I also, at the end of the day, want to do what I uh, know in my heart is what I want to do. And it's pretty powerful when you get to that point. Yeah. And, and a part of that is accepting it. Eh, maybe it won't be for everybody. You know, um, mm-hmm. th- that's not necessarily the goal. Obviously you want people to like it and it really helps if a lot of people like things, <laughs> mm-hmm. but you, you gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta stay true to yourself. And th- this was a really fun journey, uh, with, um, this short film, the narrator. Um, I, I partially, I made it the way I made it because I've been very lucky to, to, to be pitching, you know, uh, shows, in Hollywood and, and getting some, some screenplays out there. And, you know, usually you just get a nope, uh, but every once in a while you get a feedback, you get a little insight, but almost Mm -hmm. everything you hear about and almost everything you're asked is to fit something more into a box. You know, if you're doing a comedy, it's exactly what kind of comedy and what other comedy films are exactly like it. And a lot of it is just Mm -hmm. to try to make it safer and more palatable, more easy to communicate. And I think so many of us know that like, yeah. And then often some of the things that we love or break out are because they're different. Um, mm. But in the industry, it's, you know, it's people with a lot of money trying to decide to spend money. And so they really lean toward safety. You know, like, can you mm. make me feel <laughs> safe? Um, yeah. So I made this this film, which is an awkward, weird little film and not everybody's going to like it. I just made it without any sense of it's got some comedy in it, but it's not just comedic. And mm-hmm. uh, the, the ending might be unsatisfying to some people. I just, I just made it to not fit in any box because I wanted, um, mm. <laughs> I wanted to be free of that. So it was really nice to be at this festival that really embraced that. And uh, I, the, the film won the, the kind of runner up silver award for best experimental short. And it was really gratifying to be like, this is not going to be for everybody. This is not going to launch my career and make me a million dollars. But it was nice to have that that desire to just make what I want to make and see how it turns out to have that be mm-hmm. rewarded. Yeah, again, it's it's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. And and uh, and I haven't seen it. There's a beautiful shot at the end that's just wonderful. Um, <laughs> on, on an iPhone that I loved. Um, yeah, no, uh, good stuff. And and uh, I haven't been to Portland for a very long time, but keep Portland weird up there, huh? Yeah, Portland's beautiful. I now know the the mass transit system in Portland far better than I know the one in Los Angeles. I think I know the <laughs> layout of the city of Portland better. Uh, I love Portland. <laughs> great yeah. stuff and in great adventures there all right that is uh you know our life adventures which you know at the point of doing other center it, it's a big part of the podcast um we're going to also do an, an ask uh we have been doing our current ask segment we're going to do that quickly and then we're going to get into the main topic which is a history of ken's relationship with the uh, broadcast radio dj adventures uh but let's do the ask first ken uh, i'm gonna start and then i'm gonna pitch to you so uh okay. here's the deal uh, we um we we put our packs into uh patreon and it, it and putting more attention to it we revamped it uh we got some or you know uh, rewards that people were happy about we did the perilous podcast experiment and we had uh, we set a goal and, and we met it um and when i say we i mean you the listener helped us meet it because we we set up where we were going um now, quite understandably, there are uh, people who support the podcast uh, when we talk about the thing that the podcast is about. Yeah, um, yeah. And since we are now, we're bleeding a little bit and no, mm-hmm. absolutely no ill feelings to anybody who has stopped supporting. I think I'm sure there are some people who stop supporting with the intention to come back when we get back to our normal topic. Mm-hmm. That said, uh, I wanted to, to have an ask about uh, Patreon. We had set this goal of getting to 2000 a month and we've dropped significantly from there and we'd love to get back to it. If you're, you're listening and if this is something that makes sense to you, um, we've so supported, uh, appreciated the support uh, on other center. Mm-hmm. And if you want to support us while we are taking this, uh, risky, you know, adventure that we believe in, uh, that is a great way to support us because, you know, we are feeling, uh, the realities. Uh, that's my thought on that, Ken. Do you have any any thoughts or words of wisdom? No, there's, there's. Uh, I wish I had words of wisdom. 
at any point in my life for anything. But uh, yeah, I think trying to speak plainly, uh, we could use your help and support. Uh, if, if, like Joseph said, if that makes sense to you, uh, also listening, still in, engaging, uh, that, that, that helps too. Um, there's the, the podcast business itself has been changing. Um, so the ability to get ads or generate revenue changes from show to show, changes from quarter to quarter. It's it's a weird time and we're feeling that pinch as well, which is why Patreon's important. And it's been an absolute... Um, bummer. I'll just say it's been a bummer that the realities of, of the world and realities that we want to be involved in and supportive of um, change some things around here, not just for what we're talking about, but what how we're going to talk about it and the strength and vibrancy of our YouTube programming and, and a great docuseries that Jen was ready to launch that we not only um, just don't feel is right for what we believe right now, but also we can't do it. Jen being SAG. Um, it's changed things. It's changed mm-hmm. the game. And and we understand that can be frustrating. We understand that, hey, maybe you put a pin in us and you come back to us and we hope you do. Um, it, I'll say this, our Discord has never been more interactive when we talk about our favorite food or video games. Um, and I love it. I, I love it. We have a pretty active Discord for for uh, Star Wars talk, but uh, every, every day I go in the other center thing and there's 15 new messages about nachos <laughs> or golden eyes. <laughs> And and we really it, it means a lot to us. Uh, Anyways, not to turn this into a sub, sub story, but yes, there's there's a little harsh reality that we we understand we're facing right now. We understand a lot of other shows have made the decision that's right for them. Um, it's not a decision that's right for us. And and again, I want to point out, Jen is SAG. That changes a lot of what we can do. Yeah, as, it's just as, concrete. As, Concrete, and we're not going to leave her behind. Uh, I'm SAG eligible. Joseph has active contracts with SAG. Uh, wants to be in SAG. Uh, you know, if, if that happens. Um, we could maybe make it, we wouldn't make a different decision, but there's, there's the two of us who could maybe go in a little slightly different direction. We are not going to leave Jen behind and, and refuse to do so. And as just, yeah, we're in a tougher spot right now. Um, I sound like a, a, a PBS telethon, but I sounds like I'm trying to get you to watch a Ken Burns talk, but um, yeah, that's just where we're at. And if you want to support patreon.com slash four centers is a good spot to, to help us uh, right now as we approach our, our 10th season, 10, 10th Oof. broadcast season will we'll hit in January. Amazing, and thank you for everyone who is uh, who is still there on Patreon. Everyone who is just listening um, yeah, and yeah. supporting and telling other people. So many positive comments on, on social media, and uh, I'm thrilled to have people discussing nachos and, and golden eye. <laughs> yeah, I love it. A whole other podcast called Nachos and Golden Eye. We'll see. I, yeah, I can't tell you. I cannot tell you how much it means to us right now. Um, we, we, we completely understand there was going to be a change in our numbers, um, what we're doing. And maybe, a, 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 it was, it's harder to grasp for some folks. And some of you had some wonderful questions on social media of, Hey, X, Y, and Z is doing this and this, why, why are you guys doing it? We, we understand it and we're happy to answer those questions as honestly as we can. Um, uh, but we're on this path now. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if you can help, wonderful. If you can't, just being here is a wonderful help. Thank you for all your support. And with that, we're going to get into the main topic. Uh, There's some things about our podcast that don't change no matter what. 23 minutes in, and it's time for the main topic. Uh, so Ken has generously sort of, um, shared some of, some of his, uh, podcast formats from, from various things doing the life ranked. And I wanted to share a little bit by basically doing an episode of my old podcast obsessed where I interview people (laughs) about things they like. So I'm just going to interview Ken about something that I think is very important to his life, but also very important to this podcast. Cause I think Ken's experience with this has really affected the way we do this podcast. So I am going to interview Ken about his life in radio. And I'm not sure about that term. So that's my first question. I want to set terms. Ken, what, uh, what words do you use for this interest, this profession? Uh, When you think about this part of your career in life, is it radio? Is it broadcasting? Is it DJ? What is the umbrella term we should be using for this? I mean, I, I would say broadcasting, it definitely goes beyond radio, um, obviously. Um, that's Broadcasting is not just an occupation, it's a, it's a skill set and a state of mind, I would say. Um, <laughs> but I, I refer to radio a lot. Uh, it's also, you know, even at Clutter, there was a joke of, oh, did you work in radio? I hadn't heard that before. And I, I you know, I always want to make sure I'm not over <laughs> stating it like the drunk uncle at the back of a party. But it, it it's it's something that used to be in my past. 
So I used to talk about it in that like, hey, man, you, you know, I used to be on the radio. Uh, then it became, <laughs> became something that was very much part of my life again. Um, and it also was something that held back part of my life. And now it's all full circle where I, I'm on the radio again in Pennsylvania um, and around the world, uh, if you listen via the website. So uh, there you go. Uh, so, yeah, all of it kind of works. Broadcaster is the overall umbrella term, I think. Okay. Okay. Broadcaster makes sense because that that is one still broadcasts from the internet, uh, right? So mm-hmm. you can kind of mm-hmm. use that as a is a catch all term, and DJ is a specific part of it that does not necessarily apply to all of it, right? Yeah, and I jokingly refer to it as the you know uh, I am the rock and roll DJ man, um, you know, and that's kind of um, uh, and of course many voices are on the air, uh, but. Yeah, it's kind of when I say that I'm I'm basically referring to Wolfman Jack. (laughs) I was going to say. So uh, we're going to go back into the past and and we will uh, build up to your your current and renewed relationship uh, with broadcasting and and how it affects Force Center and all those things. But uh, now we're going to go doodly do doodly do back into the mists of time. Um, Mm. When you were a kid, did you listen to the radio? And now when I'm saying radio, I mean literally physically a, a box that sounds came out of pre-internet. Yeah. Did you listen to the radio and and did you like any particular DJ? Did you listen to anything that wasn't music? What was your radio experience as a kid? Yeah, um, I am trying to remember. This is great. And by the way, um, a lot of times for Center, we know uh, in other center, we have a list of programming or segments and questions. This is uh, old school. I don't know anything Joseph was asking here. So this is a wonderful adventure. Uh, I, 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 when does it really hit, right? I always, I always talk about pop culture awakening years that we all have in our lives. I refer to mine as it, it happening in 1987, mm. which anything prior to 1987, even though I experienced it, seems like ancient history, <laughs> including the cartoons and TV shows that I watched. Um, I, you know, you were a kid, but everything else, politics and, you know, things in the world, you know, it, it, you didn't know what was going on. 1987 for me, I was aware of it. I was aware that history was now happening, happening in front of me. And, and that includes being aware of like radio was the thing, the sound out of a car, right? And I, my folks didn't listen to a lot of it um, uh, while I was a kid. But around that time, I started listening to a quote unquote oldie station. Um, there's a, he's still going, I think his name's mm. Jim Zippo, Jim Zippo in the morning. And he's the classic, and I don't necessarily mean that in a good way, but a classic <laughs> morning show. Like that way. <laughs> But as a kid, as an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, falling in love with the music now for the first time, um, that was exciting. And then as a baseball fan, um, we, you know, this is this is the late 80s, you know, you, you, not everyone had, we, I think we had one TV in our house, right? So I wasn't downstairs watching baseball all the time. There was three other people in the house, mm-hmm. you know? Um my dad would mostly be on the Commodore 64, but yeah, so, so radio and I lived, uh, uh, you know, Pismo beach Royal Grande, which is about three hours North of LA and four hours South of, of, of the Bay area. So I could get all four low, not counting San Diego Padres, but I could get the, the Oakland, San Francisco, LA and Anaheim broadcasts. Mm. And so my nights were spent listening to all four of those radio stations on the dial and I'd switch back and forth. Right manually i don't think I even had presets i just said like oh th- this inning's over let me go to the a's broadcast ray fossey talking let me go to the giants with ron fairly talking uh vince scully and dodgers and and because games would start at say 705 there was one station in town i think it was the dodger station and they would pick up a syndicated um business his name was bruce i can't remember his name i was gonna try to look this up and it was a business call-in show <laughs> the most boring <laughs> But I'm 12, and so I'd have to wait for the Dodger game to start. And I'd listen to this guy, and he'd take calls, and he'd give, and he was just, but I was fascinated by it. And I didn't miss it. I didn't pick up any big, good business tips. And so there was the music, the morning, the entertaining, driving to school and hearing Zippo in the morning. And then there was this, these folks are communicating. Mm. Then you go into the broadcasters of, of, of sports. Uh, which is very important to what I do. So that that's all around the 87, 88, 89 range was when I just, re- I was on listening to the radio morning, noon and night almost. Okay. And you, it was kind of your, your window into the world. Mm-hmm, exactly. I'm a kid in a small town who never left his room. was too afraid to. And, and, and Vince Scully was talking about the world out there. Uh, business calls from people all around the country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
That's really cool. Uh, did you ever listen to or hear anything um, narrative on the radio? Like one of my first radio memories, uh, the the short window that I go on about when I lived in in Portland, Oregon, from like four to six, mm-hmm. um, and I remember vividly the radio was just always on with the music and my mom liked talk mm-hmm. shows. Uh, but then one night the talk show ended and the, this creepy organ music comes on and I hear, I think it was probably Orson Welles uh, doing, you know, the, the shadow. Mm. Um, and it was like, what is this? Mm. Stories come out of the magic air box. Um, mm. Did you ever experience any, any old time radio when you were young? I, I- I didn't. I was aware of it. I, I was very much aware at one point of, of, of the, what happened with War of the Worlds and fascinated mm. by that, which we can talk about the power of, of broadcasting and radio uh, specifically being so intimate. Um, but one of the things I would also listen to was uh, uh, Dr. Demento. Oh. And so while not quite what you're talking about in terms of narrative, and I was aware of, of Star Wars had a radio version and blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, you could communicate ideas via audio. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that led me again, did I go back and listen to a lot of the, you know, early Peter Sellers stuff and BBC? No, no, I wasn't aware of that right away, but that opened up my mind to that too. Um, cause that was something I was, I, I couldn't sing or play an instrument. So I was not, I'm not gonna be on the radio that way. Um, you know, I, I didn't have the thought of being a stand up comic yet. So it's like, oh, but I can sit in my room and record things, which is what I started to do at mm. 14. So when, when, how did you record? What, what technology did you have? I, I had a, a boom box with a microphone uh, and a cord, you know, corded microphone that looked like an old, <laughs> but it was a big, bigger boom box. And then I had the old standby clock radio that everyone had with the cassette tape. Yeah. And so both could record. So I would play, I would record songs off the radio, play them off the cassette tape record them into the microphone on the boom box and into the boom box, I would record the songs and, and then me talking or doing bits. And I created an entire world of characters and, and recorded a radio show um, for myself. <laughs> were you, I think occasionally someone heard it, but yeah. So many uh, people don't like the sound of their own voices or, or just kind of don't like the shock that our voices sound different inside our heads <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> where we hear them than they do uh, on recording. I remember the shock of hearing my voice for the first time. And I was like, what mm-hmm. is that? What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dark yeah. arts. Did you feel that when you were recording? Did you like play it back and we're like, I'm killing this? Or or were you like, um, this voice is weird? Or, or was it more like you were playing enough of a character like DJ yeah. can that it felt separated from you? It, a little separated. I've never loved my voice. My voice has changed, obviously, as, as it does over the years. Um, and I definitely have a, a different style of... I, I change my voice when I talk into microphones now more than I did ever. But th- I, I hated my voice because I have a higher pitch voice uh, w- when I'm just normally talking. I, I describe it as higher pitch. And also have uh, always have had a bit of a mush mouth um, as because I'm quiet and shy. And... I you talk about the first time. First time I really heard and understood my voice was uh, playing Mike TV, my junior high uh, production of w- Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> and I had to be put on VHS so I could be trapped in the TV. Mm. And they played that in front of the class during rehearsal, and I was just like, "There's no way I sound. Like, There's no way I sound like that." <laughs> <laughs> and so, but and, and 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 that set it up to where, yeah, you're right. You, you know, uh, I think I don't care now. I like where my voice is now. Uh, I'm, li- I'm like what I'm able to do with it. But um, I think it's an instrument. But yeah, no, I've my whole life is just that that myth of of we all believe it that our voices are horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And it is just a, a myth, right? Because everybody, a myth. we all hear one another. It's it's not a shock mm-hmm. to other people. <laughs> well, it's, what a we shame sound like. based, it's a shame based myth. It is. It is. No more shame. No more mm-hmm. shame. Um, mm-hmm. So you, so you were playing around at a young age with the idea of this is something that you would like to do. So mm-hmm. how did that lead into your first broadcasting or radio job? Did you did you yeah. target it? Did you fight for it? Or did you fall into it? How did the first job happen? Uh, I think I think fell into it in a way. Yeah, and, and this, by the way, this all started at three. I could and and I think on my Patreon page I have it. I could I could I could play it one day. Uh, I, I have recordings of me at three, two ish, three ish on reel to reel. My dad and I used to improv stories together, 
and my, the microphone. So I do, I was a rain park ranger character and he was the bear and we, and we, he would just sit down with me. We'd improv these stories. So there, there forms a lot of loves that would come in and out of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. Performing comedy, improv, storytelling, radio. But yes, yeah, so I started at 14 uh, recording shows in my room and so I was interested in it, but I'd never, you know, you don't think that's possible. God bless my folks. Even though my dad, I, I give him all the credit for doing this uh, with me when I was three and, and getting my love of, of, of the microphone going. And there was never a, a overriding encouragement to seek what you want, mm -hmm. right? There was just like, the reality is you'll probably get a job you know, that you hate <laughs> and you give it all up. That's my dad. My dad's a fascinating fascinatingly talented a animator and, and, and artist and just didn't get encouraged to seek it out. And, and the whole got out of the Navy, uh, you know, marriage kids and that dream goes away. Mm -hmm. And he's been chasing and fighting that the whole, his whole life. And, and it's a valuable lesson to learn that he doesn't intend, didn't intend for me to learn. <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, there was uh, the the radio station in town. Um, um, I knew where the station was. It's called CD 107. And I knew, you know, it was this magic, you know, you look upstairs and behind those blinds is a, a DJ talking. What is that like? Anyways, jump ahead. Did not ever think that, that could be something I could do. Uh, did want to go to Syracuse to study broadcasting and maybe be a major league baseball broadcaster mm. or a sports broadcaster. I, uh, another problem in my life, I didn't get encouraged in that. And I just got depressed and, and fell off of any kind of higher education <laughs> and, and didn't want to do it. But I was going to junior college studying screenwriting and I got a job at the end of high school. Some friends of mine were, do, were sending, we were in video production. We sent tapes, VHS comedy bits. I was doing like a reporter thing to a local UHF station. And they ended up <laughs> broadcasting that stuff. So it was senior year of high school, we had stuff on TV locally. And, it, and mm. it's horrible. It's, it's what you'd expect 17 year olds doing. And I'm not talking in terms of like offensive. It's just, yeah, it's not, it's kind of funny, but not really. <laughs> um, and uh, anyways, through that first or second year of college, they called us, said, Hey, we're going live every week, Monday through Friday. You guys want to come be crew with us. And so we did. So I was a floor director and there was like uh, people hosting the shows, some real, I, I've, I've written TV show concepts based around this to one mm. day have a sitcom about the UHF station on an avocado field in the Napomo Mesa of Aurora Grande, <laughs> California. Um, fascinating people. And, and then eventually one of them got sick and I hosted a show on a Thursday night and I did at 18 years old, did my best Letterman and Leno monologue impression because I was interested in that. Uh, Letterman is a broadcaster through and through and, and, and I was learned that skill. And out of that, I met the two, the two local morning show DJs were there. They had a show. And so me and my, my buddy kind of asked them, how can we enter? How can we get over there? And that's how it happened. They brought us over as interns. Okay. And we did it officially through our, our college or our, our, our junior college we were at. And we, we had to get papers signed every week and all that kind of stuff. But that's how it, how we get, and it was in, it was the station had changed. It wasn't, it was not that CD 107 was the name of the station. Now it was k -Bear 95. It was the same building. It was mm. one of the weird times in my life where like, I've been staring up at this building for five, six years. And now here I am in there. It was fascinating. It was wonderful. And you go through those doors and music's playing. There's merch on the wall. And you know, it's like, it's WKRP in Cincinnati. <laughs> so, so you start there interning. Do you get, to being paid and just straight up, I'm, I'm being a rock and roll disc jockey pretty quickly. Um, no, what it, yeah. Uh, um, you know, my job was pulling the CDs and stacking them and going to get coffee for my program director <laughs> down the street. Uh, and that was about it. And learn about music. My, you know, my, I also grew up as, you know, satanic panic of the eighties and mm -hmm. wasn't allowed to listen to a lot of popular music. And so I was, I was getting an education in that too. Right. And knew about the oldies music because my mom would say, well, that's, you can listen to that because that's good old music. Like, wh what's CCR singing about? What What is uh, John Fogarty, uh, uh, Fortunate Son? What's that about? Oh, it's a good time oldie song. Oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, you know, my mom still thinks Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah is his beautiful hymn. I'm like, it's about, bleep, mom. But um, I ain't no senator's son. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I'm getting an education that, but anyways, to, to jump ahead, this, this is not a beat by beat story here. Um, one day, fateful day, uh, cause again, I didn't think I could do this. I think I had the voice. I don't have, and, and, and no one there had a big giant radio voice, but I didn't think it is one day. Um, my program director goes, Hey, I need you to go in the other room. 
call into the station and we need, I need you to be a caller who's winning a prize um, because that would jumpstart the phone lines, right? People, so it's just like a total, uh, a total fake, fake out. Total fake out. And he goes, go in the promotions office, dial the number 1-800-549-BEAR. Still remember the number. And I'm just, just, you're going to, and all he said was like, just, you just say you're from Napomo and you won, you're getting the prize. I said, okay, great. So that's all he said to me. But you know me, Joseph, and you know us as performers. You can't just stop there. So I go into the other room and I call and he, and he takes the call and I just go into a character. It's probably a dumb stereotypical kind of like, you know, the Napoma is a lot of like, it's a rural part of the town. And I, I wasn't like offensive, but I just kind of played this character was like, I, I'm on a sheep farm and I'm, I'm calling the station. And my program director... And then I had one of the sheep bite me. So I'm like trying to win. I'm like, thanks. Oh, no, my sheep bit me. And I'm doing this whole thing. And like, I hang out and he's dying laughing and did not know that was in me. And so he saw it. He's like, okay. And he started to slow me, slowly work me in. So they hired me and I was kind of helping him with the morning show, producing morning show. I would do the music news uh, and the sports news. And if you ever all out there listening, started to watch me on Schmoes, no, the, the movie news that I would do, it was beat for beat what I did for the radio station at 18. Mm. Same music, Bret Hart's theme, the doom, 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 doom. And uh, doing real, the key to that was doing real reporting or news headline summaries, uh, and music news and sports news, but then work in your humor in that. It's not jokes first, then news. It's news with your humor in it. And that became popular. And then from there, uh, I was on on staff. Okay, so so yeah, you're getting a lot of different uh, parts of yourself fulfilled. So this... Mm -hmm. everything that led you to broadcasting is performance based and sort of peeking yes. out of your, your shell. Uh, that's why you got mm -hmm. to the radio station at all, because they saw you doing your Letterman impression. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. when you got uh, uh, improvised being <laughs> attacked by your own sheep, <laughs> that yeah. led to this. So then once you're actually hired, do they, you, you know, you've talked a lot about, you know, actually having like the classic um, rock DJ position where you're you're spinning mm -hmm. the hits. Does it lead to that at this station? Yeah, yeah. Eventually. Um, so I was Monday to Friday. You know, you get there 6 a.m., get there really 5.35 a.m., 6 to 10 a.m. And then I go I go to college. I was still studying screenwriting and all that stuff and um, wasted a lot of time. You and I even talked about this off air where sometimes you have one aspect of your life going well. So you kind of put your feet up mm -hmm. and go, great. I should have got off air at 10 a.m. and continued studying. I left, that was the thing. I left college after a while. After mm -hmm. two years, I, I was like, I'm done. And my friends went down to Cal Arts, uh, CSUN, and all, you know, I was like, no, I'm on the radio. I've made it. So the, the arrogance of youth strikes again. Um, <laughs> But yeah, eventually he was like, hey, can you cover a shift over the weekend? And so that's what I did. And that's slowly, that slowly worked his way. And eventually he leaves. And I, I, the last thing he does is he, you know, leaves. He installs me as a host of the morning show, which I probably shouldn't have been. I wasn't ready. Okay. Uh, but I got to host with my high school buddy, uh, uh, Matt, for, for a year. We hosted the morning show. And then an ownership issue happened, deregulation happened. And then next thing you know, I was gone. But um, f after four years. But yeah, no, that's, that's, it, it began that one day. And so after four years, you said? Yeah, if I was there for four years, uh, 95 to, uh, you know, some 95, 96, 97 into 98, so about three and a half years. How long were you hosting, like, full on, you were the host of the morning show? About a year, was it 96 into 97, and then I got, um, there's an ownership change that happened, but it was a sm another small independent station up in Cambria called K Otter bought us, and it was good. It was like the uniting of the last two independent stations in town. Okay. And you think, yes, the Rebels, uh, Mon Mothma's group has gone up to <laughs> South Chris. And then they they destroyed us as much as any other corporation would have. Okay. Um, they picked us apart, took off our DJs. And so eventually we got laid off. But what ended up happening is I, I got laid off for the morning show and was kind of depressed. I'm going to go to LA anyway. I'm going to be, I'm going to comedy. Um, but then I, after two days, I called back and I said, hey, can I, how about, do you have anyone covering the graveyards? And so for about eight months, I worked the graveyard shift as the midnight to 6 a.m. DJ. Okay. So those are the two jobs. <laughs> yes. The morning in the graveyard. So <laughs> when you were doing it, when you were being a, you've quit college, you're a broadcaster, you're on the radio, you're living the dream. Um, what was the best part of it to you? What did you, as you grew into it and, and I imagine got, got some confidence in it. What was the best part of the experience? There, there was two parts for me, uh, and, and it speaks to both parts of, of my um, 
or two big parts of my entertainment uh, interest. Uh, there was the, it, it's the most, and this is why podcasting is what it is when it's done, I think, right and right. I'm putting quotation marks around it. Um, there's no one way to do it. It's, it's such an intimate form of, of entertainment, right? It, mm -hmm. we, we are the voices you take with us. There's people probably right now listening to us in their car on the way to work, at work, at home, while they're cooking dinner. We are with you when uh, you are just being you. And that is true for that's how radio, I think, became what it is. Uh, you know, I love uh, American Gra Graffiti for a lot of reasons, but the, the Wolfman Jack stuff at the end is, is, is fantastic to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it speaks to the power and magic of it. Um, so there's that side of it. And you got to form um, a community. You got to form people calling in. Ah, Matt's calling in. Daryl's calling in. Um, uh, there was, um, I had mentioned before, there was, a, there was a lawyer that used to call in. She was uh, probably mid twenties, young lawyer, uh, in San Luis Obispo. And she had lost her husband. Her husband had died in an accident and she would call and slowly. And, and she was like, you guys were the, f meaning me and Matt, you guys were the first to make me laugh again. You're and every day, every, almost every day, we almost couldn't play the song every day, which she knew she would request concrete blondes, Joey. Um, mm. I don't know if that was her husband's name. She never told us. And she sent us a letter, tear-stained letter about, you know, you guys don't know what this meant to me. So there's that side of it. And, 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 and you're plugged in. That's what the, the four center thing, going in that discord, and just, and, and, and everybody knows your name. That, that's that. So it's the most intimate form of entertainment, I think. Um, and the, the flip side is music and taste making. I really enjoyed that part of it. Mm -hmm. Really enjoyed as I discovered music. And we had a very free range music station. We, we, we had a playlist. But we could play kind of what we wanted. Just had to write it down so the record companies would get the reporting and, and hopefully pay the artists. Um, <laughs> uh, and every Monday we had to fax that all in. But um, so that was part of the fun too. And that's always been, and that's what I do now with, with my pop rock and radio show. It's like, Oh, let me tell you about this band you've never heard of, or let me tell you about the song you've never heard of from this band. You've only heard the singles. And, and, and then you get the same people calling in and going, dude, I never, Oh, what is this song? Oh, what is this band? And so uh, that was what I loved about it just as much. Yeah. Cause yeah. it was, it was a way to really make connection. Uh, Music's so powerful. And, 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 and yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. So you, and in, then in, in, you are very familiar with the music of <laughs> those years, <laughs> the nineties. I mean, I would be anyways, right. Cause that's college years coming out of high school. Those that's the music that definitely sticks with you. Um, totally. Right. But yes, no, though that, that is, um, yeah, I know, I know the B sides. I know the bands you don't remember. I know the, you know, or there's, you remember that song? Uh, you remember Dog's Eye View? I I know that song. I know that band. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm always fascinated by it because I, I have uh, mentioned before. I you know got out of uh, high school or was uh, playing drums and into all of the new new bands mm -hmm. and the the really the explosion of grunge and then you know there's some very sad mm -hmm. deaths there. I stop drumming and I get into older music like uh, Sinatra and Ella mm -hmm. Fitzgerald and I just tuned out of a vital part <laughs> of my own yeah. cultural history and mm -hmm. sometimes i'll be at karaoke and like everybody will know these lyrics and like i'm i think i heard this song once in a car commercial <laughs> but to everybody else is like this is our music and and yeah. i don't regret everything i learned and know about the music from the past i love it and it's a big mm -hmm. part of my life my history but you are an absolute expert on the part of our generation's life that i tapped out of so like yeah. sometimes I want to be just like Ken, make me a playlist of <laughs> what I missed in my twenties. <laughs> I, I I have those shows that it's it's fantastic. Yeah, and I think um, and it's interesting too because uh, I I think the mid nineties it's it's a, a powerful, wonderful explosion of 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 artists from grunge. And I wasn't a huge fan of the grunge era. Don't love a lot of those bands, but but it's funny over time I, I go I like I was never a huge fan of Pearl Jam. And then I, I hear a Pearl Jam song now. I'm like, yes, absolutely. 10, great album. Oh, wait, you know, time, time changes that. Um, but yeah, it was also an interesting pop culture time. I think that's the last gasp of rock and roll of old uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how the system of how songs got out there, how they connected, radio, A&R people, all this stuff, even though some of it has, is still kind of the same. Um, it, it's, it's 1996 is, uh, there's a great, there was a great article. I think Spin Magazine put it out years ago, but years after this of, that was the last great rock year from what you knew about rock. Things always are going to change. You can't go back. Um, but it's such a fascinating pop culture time. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, rock and roll is here to stay, but uh, <laughs> a little bit more indie these days, I think, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. when you listen to just popular radio. So uh, some amazing, great experiences that continue to translate and, and reverberate in, in the way that you can build community as a broadcaster, as an entertainer. Mm-hmm. Besides getting laid off, was there anything that you struggled with? Was there anything about the job or the experience that you that was negative or that you realized I need to curb what I learned there or do you know what I mean? I, 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 I wasted a lot of it. Um, but some bad habits that I still sometimes carry with me of, I, I, I have a lot of tapes. There's a bag next to me here of cassette tapes of air checks. I have some of them, you know, on my computer. It's kind of hard. You know, you got to find the right gear to get that on there. I, you know, I would love sharing them with you all. Cause I sound different and I sound not good <laughs> <You know>? and, <laughs> and I'm learning and I'm still learning. I just had, had a chance to learn on the job. Um, no, I, the only problems I had with, it was my first real, I, I had some jobs before, but it was my first real experiencing, um, clashes with management mm. based off of your art. Right. Mm. And so morning show time, there was, um, my, my morning show partner and I had similar, but different kinds of humor. And he was, a, he is, uh, we don't talk as much anymore, but, um, he was a great, is a great broadcaster and is a, a just a weird, fun humor. Um, and I had, uh, I was, I was, he, he, he was, he is a Sinatra fan. And so he did not mm-hmm. understand any of this rock and roll. There was this one point, there was this great exchange with our program director before he had left the company. We were both sitting there in the morning and we're playing uh, some of the new David Bowie from about 95, 96, his earthling album. And my friend goes, when did David Bowie get so weird? And we both like spit out our coffee. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> do you think, do you think Let's Dance is, David Bowie, like, like when I love Let's Dance, put on your red shoes and dance the blues. But like, what, what do you, what? So, anyways, we had a great uh, dynamic. Um, but we, uh, there was, they wanted us, and I, I'll say this, I overall will say, and he's not always perfect, and he's definitely at times, I would say, problematic uh, in the big picture. I, I'm a huge Howard Stern fan in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, and and not so much for the whack packy kind of stuff, just especially where he is at now, but just. Over and 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 private parts came out the movie the movie version not the mm-hmm. book the private parts came out in the theater the month we got the morning show so I watched that movie eight times in a week <laughs> yeah of course and our we did not want to be shot we it was the, not what I would do but our station wanted us to be more shock jockey oh wow. And we were like, nah, man, like that's, we're a little bit more parody and a little bit more. We love the medium of radio. Saturday Night Live begins in 75 as, as the kids get the keys to the studio and they're parodying and tearing down the walls of the TV they grew up on and the culture they grew up on. That's the genesis of the show. Um, then it becomes the culture. But so we were in that spot. We were like, no, we love radio. But we want to have fun with what people know about radio. And do a broadcast based on that. And 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 I won't say we try to keep clean here, but our, our owner, not even the program director, was like, you guys need to talk about butt bleeping more than anything. I want you to hear you talk about butt bleep. And we're like, what? I was like, I'm a virgin. Like, I don't even yeah. know what that, what? <laughs> and and, and we, we fought. So we clashed with management over that. And that's my first experience of, of art and, 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 and business colliding. Yeah. And that's a really fascinating way, too, to just chase a trend. Um, Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and a much larger conversation too, about not making any excuses for, um, for, for people who have, you know, frankly, awful beliefs or for, for, Mm uh, people who continue to make sort of what is now called edgelord jokes, but just another Mm -hmm. great insight into what people our age, um, ran into where there were, there were windows of time where the people who wanted to make money and audiences wanted to play this game of how far are you willing to push it um mm-hmm. you know a, a, a real assumption that well we've turned the corner on all these issues which you know yeah. in retrospect was was incorrect and and awful yeah. but that the real push toward that and for you to have the sort of artistic integrity of like w- we admire what this mm-hmm. big name does but that's not what we're trying to do yeah. And, and this wasn't coming from your station manager from having a deep love of like, you know what will heal America <laughs> and bring people together? No, what was there that's what will bring. <laughs> that was just chasing the almighty dollar, right? Because that's because talking butt bleeping was what was popular right then. 
the station was struggling and our station had been struggling. That's why we were in a position to be bought for, I think at the time, $225,000, which even then was like, that's all. Yeah. Uh, now, <laughs> who knows? You can buy 15 of them. We weren't doing good for a lot of reasons. One of them was because we were a station that loved, like our pro the program director had put me in the job and then left, was a music fan. He, his roommate at one point was the, was the drummer of the, of the Bangles before wow, she went on to wow. be the drummer of the Bangles. He, he was a roadie for a band that toured with R.E.M. in like 1980, 81. Uh, and can confirm that Michael Stipe didn't shower much. Uh, and, and his friend's <laughs> band did the first MTV uh, news theme that uh, 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 he came from that. And he was a big Bruce Springsteen fan. And so our station was the station of old, right? It was the... You're on a on a navy ship uh, hearing a broadcast at two a.m. from the mainland, and he, ah, we've got we've got this new band you're going to hear about, right? And like that does not translate to ratings, mm -hmm. and 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 to see where we are now for even with the decision we've made as a as a podcast to go with our hearts more than our our brand. Um, look at YouTube. Um, my stuff is struggling as I have change my personal stuff to be a little bit more personal in terms of politics versus just, I like Seven Eleven, um, doing character shows and stuff that spoke about issues, things that were close to me. And, and I, I saw my numbers of my personal podcast on Knapsack Files, Knapsack Network it dropped to, it's, it's almost, almost no, no one listens to me right now. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that radio station was struggling because instead of playing the same big hit, we played the hit, but instead of playing them like every other computer programmed corporate owned radio station, we were like the last, like Tom Petty has a song in the late 90s, the last DJ. There goes the last DJ. We were, that was us. And so mm -hmm. our ratings were in the crapper. And so that absolutely to what you're saying, the owner of the station was like, you guys got to be pissing people off. It's like, great. That ain't us. <laughs> and so eventually they said, yeah, you're right. It ain't you. So they cut us. And that, that's such an important window of uh, mechanization that has affected musicians and, and what we mm -hmm. hear of music, what's popular in music for a long time and, and ties into, I think, some of the battles that are happening right now about not over mechanizing art. Yeah. yeah. An amazing oh, yeah. time. Yeah, the the algorithm, but like I, I totally get you got to play the game, thumbnails and keywords and SEO. I get it because I want those views too. But it, it's the same thing over and over. And I'm sure you can find examples of it from theater in 1860 to you know, Rome, Roman, uh, you know, Greek tragedies. And well, that one's not dirty enough. You know, I, I'm sure it's just old stories, old as time. Yeah, but it, what you're talking about when you talk about why you love it, it is moving because it's all about technology, radio broadcasting, moving into internet, uh, it, that th those are technologies that allow a connection and yes. you need to have soul. And when everything is uh, mechanized, uh, algorithm, you mm -hmm. even stuff that has soul starts to lose soul because it's just kind mm -hmm. of papered over with this, you know, whatever is needed now, be it the, <laughs> you need to use this font and it needs to be yellow is YouTube and compared mm -hmm. to your, your boss back in the day saying you need to talk about what stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you can sense the lack of soul and reality. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, I'm getting excited. Um, I'm going to have one more question and then we're going to take a break. So you got, uh, you got the graveyard shift. I, I imagine that was a, a mixed blessing. You're still doing what you loved, but the, that's, I mean, that sounds like you were sort of um, living almost a metaphor of like, <laughs> I was the dawn. I helped people start their day. <laughs> and now I am relegated to the dark, lonely <laughs> night of like, you, 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 that it would be like a little bit too on the nose uh, if scripted, yeah. right? Uh, uh, well, yeah. And I, it's funny for years, I, I had a project that's been in various kind of forms where I wanted to, it was called the last radio shift. It was like my last shift, which didn't, I actually didn't know. I, I, I ended my day one day and got woken up at 8 AM that whole, the whole station was changing and we were laid off. And that's when I moved to LA. But, um, uh, yes, no, it, the, the, I was the dawn should be the name, <laughs> the name of my <laughs> life story. Uh, I was, and I, I, like I said earlier, I had left for about three days was, you know, filing the paperwork to, to resign or leave or whatever. And then I was like, nah, maybe I'll go graveyards. And I, but I was still bitter about it. I was bitter about where I was in life. This is when I was like, now I want to go to LA and be a screenwriter and go to the groundlings and all kinds of stuff. So I was real bitter. Um, but I had a lot of fun and I held, I held back too much though. Um, 
I never used my name for six, I think it was like six or seven months. Never used my name. I used every night I created a new name. On the graveyard and, shift. On the graveyard shift. But people must have known who knew you from well, the morning show that it was you, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it was part of my thing. I was, I was, I was, I was protesting in a weird way that we got removed from the morning show, mm. even though I was thankful to have this job, mind you. I got paid five dollars an hour, literally um, five dollars. I think at at when I five dollars fifty cents when I left. Um, um, so I was a little pissed off, and it was me and my like effort, and and I just no one was, from the station was listening. So I had a list <laughs> somewhere. I had a paper. I don't know where I have I have it now. I have a paper. I, every night I write down the name, and it would be you know Fats Calhoun, which is a name I've used in other things. You know, was a uh, 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 today everybody. And I, I'm Fats Calhoun. The next night I was like I'm Bannister St. Cloud, and I just effed around because no one cared. But then I had this idea. I was like I should do I should do what I did at 14. And take calls that are me. I should record my voice. I should have characters. I should pretend. I should just have this entire world because no one's listening from midnight to six. And I got afraid. Another theme you and I could talk about about <laughs> artistic. You know, when do you when do you hold back? When do you get too embarrassed to be your true self as an artist? Um, and and I didn't do it. Years later, I'm not saying I'm on his level at all. But one of my favorite broadcasters of all time is Phil Hendry, and that's that's his whole career. He did the same. He was a normal DJ, and 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 was pissed off and tired of it. And so one night they're faking a phone call. And next thing you know, he has this entire world with, with, with Bobby Dooley and, and Ted and, and from Ted Steakhouse. It just, if you ever listen to Phil's show, just, just genius level stuff. So I'm not saying I could have done that. I'm just saying I had that idea of like, I want to do that for myself. And I didn't do it. I was too afraid. And then I just quietly went into the night. Okay. That's amazing. So um, I think we're going to do a cliffhanger here. Because I want, I want to talk about the the next steps of uh, of leaving broadcasting and going into Los Angeles. Uh, so this is just a perfect narrative break. Uh, you're down on your luck, laid off from the graveyard <laughs> shift, but the broadcaster will return. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> And we are back to continue the adventures of uh, Ken or uh, Fats. <laughs> Fats Calhoun playing the tunes. <laughs> uh, or who, whoever, whoever might appear on the other end of the microphone from me. Uh, we're going to continue that adventure, but I realize we should do a audiobook recommendation for Audible. What do you got, Ken? Oh, I said on a previous episode of Other Center, we get a little more, I don't know, direct around these parts. If you want an interesting book, it's on Audible. I'm looking at it right now. I have the hardback. It's called The Storm is Here by Luke Mogelson. It is, uh, and he is a award-winning war correspondent, and he looks at what led up to January 6th. The Storm is Here is a unique record of a pivotal moment in American history and an urgent warning about those to come. And it's on Audible. You can get that right now and support the show in the process by going to audibletrial.com slash force center for your free audiobook. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash force center. That is a great recommendation. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to learning more and more about one another's reading habits, both past <laughs> and present, as uh, as we recommend things. All right, we're going to get back to the adventures in broadcasting. So you leave uh, your hometown. You, you turn towards Los Angeles. And a lot of this is making sense to me because I didn't realize how much of your broadcasting history was tied up in performing in, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. uh, voices and characters and comedy and how present that was in your mind. So it makes sense to me that the broadcasting career was, was sort of crumbling around you, right? That that's fair. Yeah. And, and, and radio was changing. We've talked a little bit about deregulation in a previous episode and, 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 and more corporations are coming in and buying up the, the, the stations and, and um, cutting staff where so it would just be, it wasn't yeah. like you felt like you could just go and get a different, I could, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine did, uh, but she had to go up to Reno for that. And I, I was a timid, timid kid. Anyways, that didn't seem like. Now I probably would if it happened today, or you know, I was, I was single. I'd be like, oh, yeah, I am. I am going to go get a job in Altoona. But like, uh, but also those jobs again. Those jobs are starting to dry up. Uh, the industry changes, so mm -hmm. I, I, I would like a lot of 
kids, uh, you know, uh, of our ilk. Uh, I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live and, and I looked at uh, Second City in, Tor- in Toronto and, and Chicago. And then, at the, you know, this is 1998. Um, Will Farrell and Sherry O'Terry and Chris Catan and Chris Parnell uh, on Augustar had all come out of the groundlings. And, and um, prior to that, there was only a couple famous SNL alumni who were from the groundlings, Lorraine Newman, Phil Hartman, uh, 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 John Lovitz, uh, Conan O'Brien as a writer, Lisa Kudrow famously almost got SNL and ended up going to Friends, but, but she was out of the groundlings. But there was this resurgence for the groundlings in the late 90s. So I was like, oh, I can just drive two and a half hours down to LA and move there and still be close to mommy and daddy. Okay. Uh, there's still some issues we got to work through. So yes, let's do that. So that's so, why I went down there. Okay. That all makes sense. But uh, the, the thing that I'm interested in is we're focusing on, on the broadcasting part of yourself. Um, you and I have both talked about having the gift and curse of having lots of different creative interests and, mm-hmm. and they overlap. Uh, how much in your mind were you saying I've been denying my real dream, which is the performance, the Saturday Night Live, the playing characters, and I'm putting the broadcasting aside. Were you walking away from broadcasting or were you like, I'll get back to that later? You know, how did how did you reconcile the two dreams? Yeah, no, you're you're speaking the truth there of just like um, maybe forgetting what you learned or forgetting who you are and hyper focus on one thing, or maybe not understanding your journey, journey so far. Uh, and, and I, I, I felt like that, all okay, right, that's done. That was fun. Uh, I missed it. Um, but I would sit, I, I had a job at a movie theater when I moved to LA and I was like, I'd sit up in the break room and I'd let up, you know, kids going to college and wanting actors and this, and I'd be like, Oh yeah, I'm 20, I'm 22 at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be in radio kid. <laughs> you know, like it was over. It was over. By 22, you were yeah. an old workhorse from the, the bygone days. Yeah. You want to know about the gym blossoms? I met the gym blossoms. Yeah. You know, like, and, and I wish I had understood that it was all the same thing. Yeah. That is and all so, tied together. It was like, cool. Now, you know, let me go. I have some instincts to do characters and stuff, but I didn't understand it was the same. It's it, it, it's same kind of art. Yeah. So you're, you're in LA. Growlings is going well for a while. Mm-hmm. Did mm-hmm. you have any sort of desire to, uh, obviously they're overlapping and you're, you're using lots of the creative skills and the playing characters, but there's still that, like some of what you were talking about of your love of broadcasting, it's not about playing a character who's having real honest connection mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. the widow wants to hear Joey. I found this uh, album and I, or this song and I want to share it. And that isn't about playing a character. That's about you as a person right. connecting in this over this mysterious, you know, connection over the airwaves, this romantic, intimate, but far away connection. Yeah. D- did you come to a time where you realized this part of my broadcasting career is being fulfilled by being the, in the ground lanes and, and doing stand up, but this other part isn't, and I want that back? Y- yeah, uh, there was, um, but not the direct, I, again, a theme in life. Like uh, I was having this, by this time in the security business, doing that day job thing, thinking the ground lease is going to, I'm going to be on SNL in two years anyways. So why do I have to worry about it? Um, I didn't even go study sketch improv anywhere else. Like people told me to, I was like, no, nope, no, nope, I'm, I'm doing good here. And um, put my feet up, you know, played mm-hmm. Tony Hawk Pro Skater and didn't concentrate <laughs> on my other things. And I could have got a weekend internship at a radio station. Uh, 97.1, the FM talk station just exploded in LA around that time, which was this concept of let's take AM talk and put it on FM. And it was very popular at the time <laughs> eh, for some bad reasons or some bad personalities. I definitely didn't like that and, and, and despise now, but uh, I could have, I could have done that. You know what I mean? I, and if years later I'd meet friends and through other things and like, Oh, what did you, Oh, I worked at this radio. I'd be like, Oh, you, Oh my God, you produced at 97.1. And, uh, and he's like, yeah, you know, that's the job. I was an intern. It's like, I could have done that. And I didn't, I didn't seek it out. I got afraid and stayed in my lane um, because I did miss that. Because I would drive around, we'd have security, you know, uh, grave, I worked graveyard shift for a lot of that time in security. And we had, a, you know, our patrol vehicles were just Ford Explorers. And so we had CDs in them. And so I'd bring in some six or seven CDs or mixed CDs. <laughs> and and my sergeant would listen. And one time, one sergeant turns to me and goes, man, you got some of the greatest music, man. I've never heard these songs. And I was like, yeah, I'm good at this. So, so that muscle was needing to be worked out. I just didn't, I just didn't see a path forward. Yeah. 
that that makes a lot of sense that it was a part of your skill set, a part of your love, a part of your conversation, but not a part of what you were actively doing with your life. Yeah. 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 So when did broadcasting come back into your life? It was, you know, look, podcasting, I think I've talked about other spots, so not to remix, remix it too much, but I, I remember, you know, I've always been a little bit of a, uh, you know, technophobe where I'm just afraid of not of new technology, but I'm just like, I don't know how to do it. So I guess I just won't try. And, you know, I had a Dell laptop or whatever, and I didn't know how to record. How do you record on that? <laughs> and my friend was in a band at the time that he'd started, a pop punk band. Um, and he would record music home. So I said, hey, can I borrow your microphone? And I was like, I'm going to do the, mu the, the music news I used to do. And I'm going to release it on these websites people have now. <laughs> Maybe even Friendster. <laughs> and I, I, all it needs is record. They, they were two-minute segments. So I've had just every week do this on my own. And he was like, yeah, sure, use my microphone. And so I recorded two of them and just didn't know what to do with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so podcasting starts to emerge around this time. And it was hard to do. Our buddy Ken Plummet, uh, you know, he's he's been in the podcasting game since almost the word go. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about it one night. We were playing Fortnite. I was just like, Ken, tell me about the old days. And, and I was like, how did you get your podcast out? And he goes, it was hard. Yet you had to, you know, it was linked to <laughs> emails, it was websites. It wasn't, ever, not uh, everyone had an RSS feed. A hand crank you need to do quick. Yeah. yeah. You had, so it was a different thing. I have some friends um, I've worked with over the years at a production company called Drama 3-4. They went uh, what we would now call viral in 1999-ish, 2000-ish, wow. maybe uh, 2002 range. I can't remember around that time, but they went viral with a video of auditions for the new Star Wars films. Mm. Um, and sub question there, one of their friends at the time was the older brother of Hayden Christensen. And wow. they all remember when he got cast and they were like, the quiet kid in the corner is going to be Darth Vader? The little... <laughs> Don, whatever his name is, Don's little brother. But they did a video of auditions and it, it went quote unquote viral. It cost them thousands upon thousands of dollars because they had to pay for the bandwidth on their website. Mm, that's right. And all the downloads cost them money. You would It's impossible to think that now, right? Like yeah. you, you go viral on YouTube, you're buying a Porsche. Yay. They, they cost them money. And so I was, I was intimidated by that. Instead of taking time to learn it, I pulled off. Then I got fearful and then out of fear came ignorance and suffering because i just kept saying as as other people around me started doing more podcasting in 04 05 06 07 right i was like i i did the real thing i did radio you're doing fake things by the way one of my friends at the time who became my roommate who was a in the in the rock and roll hall of fame as a dj was saying the same things mm -hmm. um, and if i had just shut up embraced change adjusted to what was going on and realized it's just the same heart. Art is the, is the, is the topic sentence here, not the mm -hmm. medium. Uh, I would have been, I'm not saying I would have been, you know, farther along career wise or monetarily, but like I, I would have been more fulfilled and would have started to found, find my voice sooner. So it wasn't until 2011 that this comes back to my life when, when, when my buddies over at the Schmoes were doing a podcast and I was like, literally love, love them to death, but especially Mark. And I was just like, you, you guys, you guys are talking <laughs> in the microphone. No, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. I should be doing that. Um, and that's, that's when I started to get over myself a little bit. That's great. Uh, the, the, you, you said a lot of very important and interesting things and, and boy, as, as we get older, I just see that everywhere of, um, people I know who accept some amount of change thrive. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. people I know who who still get caught in that the music that was great was I heard when it was twelve was great and everything else is mm -hmm. garbage like mm -hmm. start to see that reflecting in other parts of their life um, mm -hmm. and how important that is and I think I've told you before and I probably said it on on Four Center I had the monthly comedy show and when I was living in London with Sarah everything to me was about live performance that was my hang up of live performance is the is the true, raw, real thing, and almost everything else is a is a pale imitation, which was a ridiculous thing to think because I like television and movies. It's probably yeah, yeah. fear based, but because I couldn't, you know, pop back and forth from the UK for a monthly show, I was there for three months. I made these little videos of Sarah mm -hmm. who would help me with a camera, not a phone, 
uh, take photos. And then I put them together with music and made a little narration. Like we went to uh, mm-hmm. Wales and in, in the most popular beer there at the time that they were, I don't know if it was the most popular, they were advertising everywhere was a beer called Brains. So we took, uh, you know, photos all over Cardiff of me pretending to be a zombie searching for this beer Brains and then <laughs> did a narration to it and mm-hmm. sent it back to play in the live show just because I couldn't perform in the live show. And mm. the, I, uh, the last one I made, I had uh, sent back, but then it got delayed. So I was physically in the audience for it. Mm. And my friend says, and this is now 2006, uh, like mm. uh, May 2006 or June 2006. And I play this video and it's like, oh, great. It got some laughs. That's great. Uh, mm. And my friend says, you should put that on YouTube. And I'm like, what is YouTube? <laughs> what now? Yeah. What is a YouTube? I'm like, oh, people put up funny little videos like this. And I was just like, why? It's not live performance. Right. Why would, why would you do that? And I think about that moment all mm. the time of like, mm-hmm. what if I had just like, I wouldn't, I'm not saying I would have, uh, you know, been a pioneer of YouTube. Um, mm-hmm. But what, how would it have affected my life if I had embraced it more? Embraced change. <laughs> Yeah, that's and that's the lesson. You don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know either. I don't I'm not saying I would have had, you know, the first successful podcast, uh, but like that's the lesson. And that's le- and it doesn't mean you know, you know, you and I will, will talk about there's there's nuance to what's going on and 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 um just because you can change to a new form or AI or something doesn't mean you should or should at least at least analyze what you're doing with it. Yeah, uh there's something to it and and I do worry about I I'm, I'm it, tremendously impressed by younger generations who could just pull out a phone and just create some wonderful content that connects in 10 seconds or less. Um, I, I don't know if they all have the chops to go on stage for an hour, but, but maybe they don't need to, right? Mm-hmm. Not for me to say it's for what do I want to do with this and how do I want to embrace it? And, and I still struggle every now and then I should probably do. I had a great conversation with Amy Warple on, on the set of your movie of, uh, you know, if you ever, if you all don't follow Amy, she's tremendously funny and talented and, and, um, I hadn't had a chance to really get to know her yet. It was the first time I ever really worked with her on anything. And she was like doing these, she's doing these wonderful reels and stuff on her Instagram page. And um, she's like, it's hard work. I, I have to do one or two a week and you have to feed the algorithm. Yes. But I, I'm writing them. I'm shooting them. Editing. It's work, but I need to, I need to embrace it. You know, it was, was a, her mm. kind of her thought. And I admire that because uh, I, 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 every once in a while I'll get in my car and I'll shoot something and people you know, it doesn't get great views, but people are like, oh, this is great. you should do more of these. I've even had friends write me. This is great. You should make this your thing. I'm like, you're right. I should, you're right, Joe Star. I'm going to make this my thing. And then I shoot two more and go, God, I'm bored. And God, I don't want to do this. And I just move on. So it's well, all lessons. I think that's a fascinating conversation of the difference between embracing change and figuring out, you know, we've been talking about how different mediums and different desires and what is popular in that through all of those pressures, you still have to find that sort of glowing core of who are you and what do you want to do? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, for, for the issues that you lay out about yourself that you talk about often, but are really talking about on this podcast about fear and taking a step back and you got one thing going, so you don't have to have a second thing going. So, I mean, I would, I would ask you about, and then we'll get back to broadcasting about things like reels or TikTok. When you make mm-hmm. a couple, uh, and then you go, nah, mm-hmm. is that, um, are you, are you falling into habits of not wanting to keep up with the work, not seeing the immediate, uh, you know, result, mm-hmm. or are you responding to something in you that is the glowing core of what you care about? And yeah. I think with some of that algorithm stuff, I'm not against change. And for the people it works for great. And when I have time, I love doing the not unboxing videos and, and having connection. Mm-hmm. But for me, the 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 reels and everything is so algorithmic it doesn't feel like as much of a connection as live yeah. performance or even podcasts do you mm-hmm. think you're responding to the fact that for you it, it's not speaking to the soul of who you are as an artist or a communicator yeah i think there's a lot of truth to that uh a lot of that i have fun doing them um and i have um and maybe it could open up some anal- analysts, uh, analysis of my of my soul as well. But you and I, you know, you, you were gracious to bring me on to your short film, the, the the last one. And I told you one of my weaknesses, I think, as an actor is I get so in my head about I got to hit my mark. I got to hit the lines. Uh, I got to hit every syllable. I got to get, you know, cheat out my face to the camera, camera acting stuff. 
that I, I, I lose a lot of myself where if you were shooting a mockumentary and as an improv scene, I'd nail it every time. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I just have, I just, that's a little bit more myself. So if I sit down in my car and do, I'm going to go to a target parking lot and I'm going to shoot something funny about going to target and I just shoot it. it though usually the first one or two are so organic and real. And then I start to be like, well, all right, I got to do that thing. Cause that part of the video worked. I got it. And then, it, yeah, you're right. It's not, it's not real to me. And then I, then I get bored. I get frustrated and move on, especially if you're not getting views. If I, you're never going to just release one and get a million views, but you know, that's part of the problem. But if I like it, I stick with it. Uh, I, when I switched my podcast to Saturday night knapsack, which was, I did two years of scripted and improv audio content that was parody and, and satire, and just my personality. I did not stop. I would get up every Saturday about 10 a.m., have a coffee, have a breakfast, play some video games. By 11, I'm writing, and I would write and record it up until I released it at 6 p.m., sometimes at 5.59, putting the last finishes touch, finishing touches. And I only stopped because I needed a little bit of my life back. Mm -hmm. but I still miss it. I created a bunch of characters, and I created, and it was my viewpoint of the world. I, 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 I love... Um, for 10 years have been part of, uh, you know, the ASMR community in the sense that I watch these videos to the bizarre, they're kind of weird, but it distresses me, it relaxes me and it helps. Me. It's, it's, it's a thing. And so now I started making videos. I have a small channel. No one's it's, it's not the immediate uh, bankroll that everyone else seems to have in ASMR. <laughs> I haven't hit the algorithm, but I love doing it and I'm still sticking. And it's hard. You have to f shoot where the dogs are quiet. Grace is out of the house and Burbank airport planes aren't flying over you. I have to have complete silence. Uh, it's hard to do in the summer because <laughs> I'm sweating on the thing. <laughs> and, and you have to edit them. You have to put them up. But I love doing it. And, and the comments, people are who don't know me from any of this stuff are going, hey, man, this is like my favorite ASMR channel now. I don't know if I'll ever hit. I don't know if I'll ever get a, a, a thousand views so I can, or a thousand subscribers so I can get money. And but I don't know. But to your point, when you find something that it syncs up with your soul, you'll, you will find a way to come back to it. And I think broadcasting was always there. And then podcasting started to emerge. And, 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 and even then, I've gotten better as a broadcaster by realizing what do I want to do with that? Mm. Yeah, you have the skills to know how you want to use them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for the, the detour into evolving technology because that's, that's just such a, a big part of what we're all dealing with. Yeah. And, and I think a big part of the, the ideas that are emerging as we talk about your adventures in broadcasting. Um, but to get back to, uh, yeah. yeah, go, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I hope people are finding it informative, entertaining, but it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, I think about this stuff a lot because of, you know, art and what is art, 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 me, art has meaning. And what is your style of art? You know, we all have to ask that question of ourselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have, uh, what means do we want to use to say it? And then also, kind of importantly, <laughs> what do we want to say? Mm -hmm. Kind of, mm -hmm. kind of an important part of it. So you are, you are back to the classics. You are back to how it all began when you're doing the news on Schmoes. Mm -hmm. No, and if anybody who isn't familiar with that and is a popular, uh, it, it's kind of, Schmoes. No, was kind of the morning zoo crew updated for mm -hmm. movies and YouTube. Right. And then you were doing the, the real, but yeah. funny news riffs. And then from that yeah. started doing podcasting, like actual straight podcasting. Yeah. Started to, all right, I'm going to launch my own in 2013. But by the way, I want, that took me a long time. We were thinking we'd talk about that in a previous episode. Cause I was afraid of the tech and did not know how to do it. And mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. finally do that. And, yeah, and then 2014 Jedi Alliance launches on um, Popcorn Talk Network, and so now I'm hosting a, a show regularly, and yeah, then then it starts to pick up from there. Yeah, and you at that point, once you're doing, I mean, doing the the schmoes no like bits, you're 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 doing bits, you're doing comedy, so you could even connect that more to your comedy history. By the time you're hosting the Napsock Files and you're interviewing people, um, mm -hmm. are you are you thinking I have returned to broadcasting? slowly but surely it started to get there yeah absolutely i, I got over it uh, uh over the the yeah, arrogance of i used to play the gin blossoms into the refreshments and you didn't <laughs> get over that um but uh it, even then it's been a journey i think i'm better now at it than even then um um and just knowing what i want to do again what do i want to do with it and sometimes you just want to have fun of course i don't want to I don't want to lose my ability just to be silly. I think there's a lot of serious things in the world that changed the way in which I approach my art, but um, that's also part of the goal too. You want to be entertaining. You yeah. Hope. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, ab- absolutely. And and I don't think that has ever been uh, a concern <laughs> uh, yeah. that you're not being entertaining. So this is a really fun question for me to ask because I have lots of thoughts on what the answer is uh, mm-hmm. or answers are. But I'm just going to ask you to see what you think. Uh, how do you think Force Center, what it is, uh, what it was, uh, what what it will be, how do you think Force Center is affected by your history with broadcasting and radio? Um, I think, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious, very curious to your perspective and, and, and Jen's perspective is, is, um, you know, it wasn't like a, we we're here we we're here doing star Wars radio and we got sports and weather and this and that, but I, I, I do have, a. I believe it's so funny because this week I'm teaching an adult podcasting class at a library. <laughs> I'm kind of thinking these answers. <laughs> Adult podcasting. Yeah. Oh, uh, I've okay. Okay. Yeah. You're fr- it's free to attend. Uh, um, I believe in, 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 I have some I- ideas on what I think broadcasting is and how it works and how podcasting is part of that. And I, I think I brought that to Force Center to a certain degree. Um, and you want to adapt. You don't want to be hold to, you know, one view of things. But like, I, 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 I hate just sitting around and, and, you know, as they say, to use the term shooting the shit, like, I don't, I don't love those shows a lot. I don't think that's, you're not doing much with it. It's a lot of, it opens the door for silliness, but not for, for poignancy. Uh, and, 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 and I just, the ability to drive a show forward from point A to point B, this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, this is, we're approaching the news and this segment ends and then we go into this segment. It just always has worked for me. So I, I think there was a, a lot, especially you and Jennifer, you know, at the same broadcast table, brought your skills and your views of the world and all forms into this wonderful thing. But I had emerged from Jedi Alliance with Mott Garrett, who was, who's a, a, an Australian DJ and host who, uh, you know, her and I communicate by eyes. We, eye contact was how we got, you know, you, you talk, I talk, I, this segment, that segment, and, and it was formatted down to the minute. We didn't plan any words. But I think, I think that's, that's an older style, maybe. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always work. Um, but it, you get stuff out of it. And that's kind of my argument. Uh, and, and, and yet it allows other people to get, to bring things to the table, you know? So, you, you know, you, as the story goes, you know, you show up and it's like, Hey, I'd like to talk about the themes of Force Awakens. And I'm over here going, well, I'm, I, I'm used to a world where we just talk about what we saw, you know, like, okay. <laughs> and that grow, we grow it, uh, forward. But like, I, I just, you know, have this weird part-time job and they brought me in to test other live show hosts they, they didn't want to put me on air but i was like okay and, and i even said look I, I have a different style than what you all do around here and i did a test and they didn't necessarily they kind of didn't like what i did they were like <laughs> well it was a little you know quieter and and and, and but the, but the two other hosts that they brought on with me they go but the, the producer goes but it's weird we did about set they did about seven shows that day your episode was, and we did like 15 minute episodes. Your episode, we got the most out of those people. Mm-hmm. And I said, yes, my point exactly. <laughs> my, my work here is done. I, and I even said, I go, I know my style is a little bit of Bob Costas covering baseball. I am, I am John Chancellor and Walter Cronkite to you all. I also have more gray in my beard than anyone in this building. I know that. I know Twitch streamers don't need to know who Tom Brokaw was. I know mm-hmm. that. But, what do you want to do with this microphone that you have in front of it? What do you want to do with this show? Do you just want to sit around making fun of movies and doing wild Marvel predictions? Or do you want to talk about it? And do you want to get the ideas out of your hosts? And a host should be able to do that. A broadcaster should be able to do that. And 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 I believe strongly in that. So answer your question. Now I just now I'm just getting grumpy about this job. Because <laughs> they then they haven't brought me back. And and then one other one, they brought me one time as a guest and I wanted to talk about something and everyone shut me down on the show. You know, yeah. want to talk about the themes of, you know, we're going to go into details because we're trying to talk about it. But hey, there's this new superhero movie with three women in the lead. I think this is saying something about society and how uh, women are forced to not work with each other. And they're sometimes adversarial to each other. I think this is a big concept. And everyone looked at me like I was an idiot <laughs> and made dumb jokes and went on with what they were doing. And to me, that's a waste of what you're doing with this this art form. Uh, and I think Force Center wasn't, it wasn't like, I, you know, we all were in my apartment the first week and I was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. It's like, no, we're going to talk about Star Wars. We're going to have fun. We might talk about how much I hate Puffer Pigs. But it it, 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 it was always a broadcast. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense. And, and I, I'm uh, tickled by one of the things that you said about like that, it, you know, you didn't start out with like a, 
it's it's the radio show here the segments but that was one of the original ideas of like for mm-hmm. now we'll do uh th- this kind of episode and that kind of episode but eventually we're going to build to maybe we'll have like uh, you know this one mega show that's segments yes um yes and uh and it naturally evolved into no no if we if we did one show that <laughs> had seven yeah. segments it would last 28 hours <laughs> um the a little yeah. bit of evolution there no i think that there was um a, a really great um agreement from our various experiences i think uh jen being an actor who's used to being mm-hmm. presentational um but also capable of of course being incredibly casual and honest but still having a little bit of that this is a presentation it's like you know yeah, yeah. we're on stage or in front of the camera we're in front of microphones um mm-hmm. i think for myself having a lot of experience as a as a writer a producer in particular putting on variety shows where you organize mm-hmm. stuff and you keep it moving um in that you have i think the big thing is when podcasts became popular it's now, I think, kind of past, but it became a joke that at the time, before podcasts, people were used to everything having segments and everything being sort of rigid. Mm-hmm. And so there is no structure. It's just three dudes in a basement going wherever they want, had this mm-hmm. brief window of that is revolutionary and shattering. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and then very quickly, like, oh, a little bit of structure is good. <laughs> yeah. And that was always what I craved with a uh, variety of shows. And it was always the, the formats that I loved of like, let's put down enough railroad track so that people can feel when we're teetering. So they feel both safe and thrilled of like, we've laid down the track. We know where they're supposed to go. And now they're just going to go off it a little bit. And then they got back on it. I think it makes audiences feel both safe and excited. And that was always really important to me to have enough structure, Mm -hmm. enough sense that it's a presentation that you're on the rails, but there's always the possibility of going off of them as well. So I don't know if I was, would have, necessarily a, a approach for centered. I don't, I didn't say any of that to you, but it was clear yeah. that we were aligned on that of like, yeah, we, we want to have room to be the people in the basement going off topic. Uh, mm-hmm. But always with that structure that kept us moving forward. Yeah. Moment, when I, when I teach this stuff, momentum's a word I just repeat to, to people to drown me out. Momentum, momentum, momentum. Uh, the, sh- the show's got to always be moving forward. Not that you feel it, not that it's at a rocket pace, but that we're 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 presenting something. And I, and I think I don't need every show to begin with from the center of the galaxy, you know. But that that was something that just like why wouldn't you say something to welcome people to the show? My pet peeve, and you you and I've been on shows before, and I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be an a hole about it, but like when I'm a guest on a show and they're like, all right, all right, all right, we're going, we're going, all right, hey. Gay. All right, uh, Ken. So we got a guest. What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? You drive me crazy. <laughs> Give me a show. This is a show and entertain it. And yeah, I, I, you need to find that balance. I, I, I think I've told this joke before, but there was one day, the one day in my morning show days. This is back in '97, where we switched the time in which we did the the, the news and music by ten minutes. Mm-hmm. We're just like ah, you know, maybe one of I was maybe it wasn't ready. It was a busy morning, and so instead of doing the news at six twenty-five a.m., we did it at six thirty-five. People called us. I'm not joking. Called us, dude. You made me late to work because I know <laughs> when I hear you do the news, I, I know that I'm this far along on my morning routine. <laughs> and they were like, dude, I was late to work. Several people called. So you know, you know you maybe maybe you want to avoid that. You want to avoid being repetitive, but also I think it just it's it's about momentum. It's about structure. It's about uh, knowing the the playing field that you're on. So then you can have fun. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, I think so. For for my answers, then of of how I think Four Center has been affected by your history with broadcasting. Some of it overlaps, I think, with the experiences that Jennifer and I have had. But I think you have a really natural instinct of uh, for the mix between presentation and intimacy. Like everything you and I have been talking about, it's kind of presentation. We're putting on a show. We're letting you know when to expect the next beat. We're moving forward. We've got enough of a plan. So we're not um and on too much. Uh, but then within that, this great sense of th- the gift of this medium, broadcasting, podcasting is mm-hmm. the intimacy. So I think you always have that good sense of the mix between presentation and intimacy. 
And then the real practical one is I gone back and forth with my podcast obsessed about when I just did it raw versus when I did it edited. <laughs> and you were just like, uh, uh, I, I, I come from radio. Uh, the record button is on. We go. And only if there is a massive problem. And this came yeah. up, in fact, when I was with my in-laws, my brother-in-law, I was like, so how much editing do you do for all those podcasts? It's like, well, uh, my my partner on the podcast uh, comes from broadcasting, comes from radio, so none. If we accidentally say something awful, you know, yeah. uh, once we we once a guest uh, went to the bathroom and we forgot to take that out. <laughs> but that but that was not me <laughs> forgetting to we yes that was uh, that I occasionally have those gaffes, but those are all on me. Anytime you hear those, those are me. And I and people will tweet. I just love that you left that behind the scenes stuff in, and I and I wake up like this. Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> Joseph, I got to take the episode down. <laughs> it's only happened like a very few times. There was one time that I mangled a creator's name. I was I was tired and I thought I had it and I mangled it to the point where I thought it was just really disrespectful. That's like one of the few times I've been like, Ken, can you please edit that out? But we don't edit. Uh, and, and to me, that comes from totally from your comfort with broadcasting live. How do you feel about that? How, how do you feel that that is a part of, of what we do? Yeah, it's it's important to me. Number one, because I'm I'm kind of lazy. I don't I don't want to go through and edit episodes. But <laughs> do it. It's it's the dividing line. When 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 I say the term broadcaster, that I, I mentioned Letterman earlier. Letterman was a comic at Comedy Store, um, but started as a weatherman. Idolized Carson. All that. Carson was was a broadcaster, not a comic. And Letterman was famously uh, combative with comedy. <laughs> he <laughs> he did not always succeed. Um, but there's a way to, it, it, there's just, it's a certain thing. And again, I don't want to ever get too old school because there's some great modern day broadcasters mm -hmm. who are well. One of my favorites to watch, I, I watch them in clips more than anything, Graham Norton. Oh, he's amazing. a master. I mean, he's he, amazing. You you yeah. look at that, people see the, it, it, people just see like the clips or whatever because Facebook gives mm -hmm. them to me all the time. Watch yep. the whole show and it is a master class. He makes little jokes, but you're always like, how do you, you think it's, it's just getting incredibly, oh, you charming, famous people. He knows exactly what to ask and tease mm -hmm. them up and leads them into little interactions with one another. He's a master. He's absolute master. And, 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 and that's kind of the dividing line. I'm not saying I'm on Letterman's level or Graham Norton's level. I just think what we do here, uh, I'm not, and by, by the way, you know, us saying an um, and you know, I, I stumble over a lot of words, say things wrong. There's been a couple of times, We've gone through, and I, you know, I've misspoken. So I, I shouldn't have said that that way. And I'll go in and take it out. Are you done that? I, um, I think there was one time Jen. We can reveal now had kind of revealed early what she was going to be doing at Star Celebration Anaheim. Yep. yep. And and she next day. So we took that out. Yeah. So I'm not opposed to editing, but I hear this a lot from podcasters out there. Yeah. Well, thanks. I go. Well, hey, when's this out? Um, uh, two months. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to edit it. And why, why, why are you editing it? I don't care about ums. I, I don't want to say um. And, and you, you, there's a, there's a four center bingo card out there of all the little things you and I say, but I, I will say a lot of the little things we say, uh, I can't even think of them right now because they're just so uh, inherently part of my soul and, and yours as well are designed to cover the pauses if I sense you uh, need a swallow because you've been talking and you need water <laughs> or uh, you're coughing or that that's with the uh -huh or mm, yeah, OK, those little things. A lot of you and you're not making fun of us. It's just part of listening to us. That's intentional. That's part of what we do. I don't care about it. Um, I, Can you hold the, the floor for an hour with someone without any cutting with no net? That's that's what makes you a broadcaster. And, and that's the difference to me. And and make it entertain and still make it poignant and make it purposeful and yeah. and not just be messing around. And that's why I don't like those. Like, you know, I don't, I'm now I'm just thinking I'm grumpy to some shows, but I've been blessed to be guest on shows as you have. But I just I just I can't sit. I can't deal with when they're like, oh, right. OK. Uh, and they'll say to me, oh, don't worry, we're going to edit this out. I'm like, what, then what are you doing here? <laughs> like, what are you doing? What yeah. are you doing? I, I do get the point of editing and, and I had a co-producer on Obsessed mm -hmm. for a while and, and she would, you know, make some good suggestions of, hey, you asked this person this question and they really took a while to get to the heart of it. Can we just got to the heart of it? And like sometimes I'm like, yeah, that makes the show a little bit sharper and all that. But then every once in a while she'd cut a little close to the bone and all of the ums and the likes and the wells and the pauses and the, you know, people mm -hmm. famously say, 
that's a great question to buy time, whether they think it's a great question or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you'll have an episode full of, that's a great question. And, and I'll even be like, I asked it and it's not. You're just buying time. You know, <laughs> you get those things that can slow something down, but also make it feel entirely organic. And going back to what you understand and respect about the medium of intimate. Mm-hmm. Uh, a swallow, a like, an um, a clearly padding for time because you're trying to get back to where yeah. you were some of those can start to drag it down but those mm-hmm. things make it feel real and authentic and intimate and that's the mix to me about the mix between presentation and intimacy yeah 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 and i don't mean i don't mean to be hardliner on it i just yeah it's it's um and and, and trust me there's other things you know when i do scripted or you know do a monologue type of thing or, or whatnot but like even when i record my 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 Saturday night naps like they got, I, I, I was live to tape for myself. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I, 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 I just think it's, it's, uh, it's part of the fun too. You know, when I, when I'm doing radio live, I don't do radio live other than pop rock and radio. My, my radio station thing is, is in, in my room recorded in Burbank and I send it to Pennsylvania. But like, um, back in the day, like, yeah, there'd be times you'd forget the band name or what you're doing or, <laughs> and you want to avoid it. You absolutely want to avoid it. You want to be perfect, but it's also not not what people gravitate to. Yeah. I, I love that you said live to tape because I think that's probably what you said the first recording of like, I, I, I go live to tape, uh, which is clearly the legacy of even the technology <laughs> yeah. of broadcasting. Yeah. And I think if you said to like a, a really great, you know, 18 year old TikToker, do you go live to tape? They'd be like, the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. No, that, yeah. It, 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 I, I love there's like, you know, um, standing in front of a camera doing a, a YouTube movie review and doing jump cuts and stuff is a skill. Cause I, I, I used to work with one of the best Jeremy Johns at Collider and, and it's a skill mm-hmm. and he knows what he does well. Uh, Jeremy also, by the way, was, 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 was pretty darn good in a live setting. So whether he would agree or not, I, I, I liked working on shows. Um, but I've seen other folks come in uh, at screen junkies. We'd bring in some viral sensation like people, like, oh, that video hit, let's bring them in. And I've just seen them fall flat on their face when they can't cut, they can't edit, they can't do it. They, they have to think on the fly. And and so you do your art form. This is our art form. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's where I get a little grumpy. <laughs> uh, that could be the subtitle of this podcast. And that's where I get a little grumpy. How do you think, you touched on this, but how do you think your your love of broadcasting has affected the way you communicate or connect with people? Like you you have an understanding of, what the power of the medium is for making connection, but have you, have you, has it translated into your real life interactions? Do you have moments where in the real world you feel like my broadcasting skills are helping with this moment or hindering with this moment of in-person connection? It can be both. Uh, you know, it can be both. I, I can, I, it's not a character. Well, I always say, yeah, it is a character. If there's, there's four center Ken and there's DJ Ken, and there's pop rock and Ken. There's, yeah. I can. They're not, <laughs> I get, they're not, um, yeah. Uh, Ken is me and I am Ken. Um, but they're not, it's not fake. I think people, you know, could misinterpret that or not want to be afraid to say I'm playing a character. I'm not, you know, rest in peace. Paul Rubin's a great influence on my life. You know, that was a character. Uh, he, he was a character, but I'm sure he would tell you there's probably a lot of him. It's how we communicated with the world. It's how I communicate with the world. But sometimes it, I think it hinders me where if I'm, if I'm not in the mood or, or you, you know, I always say, if you get in a car with me, I don't talk much. I drive, I can drive, I drove cross country three days, 12 hours a day. I didn't say one word. <laughs> you know, like I didn't, um, The person in the car with me. Um, but other times if it's, I'm better at, if it's like what you were describing at the film festival. You know, uh, I, I last year I was up at a film in my hometown, but it was Central Coast Film Society. I didn't know anyone there other than Sarah Risley, uh, who was running the event and listens to a lot of my shows and been a Schmodown fan. And I knew her from that, but she was busy running the thing. I had no one else to talk to. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and and Daniel, the guy, Daniel Lair, who ran the show as well, but he's busy. So I had to, I had to interview people, you know, uh, I had to turn it on. And I think that's where it helps me. Uh, cause when I'm not on the microphone, this is how I communicate my ideas in the world. I'm not a class clown. I don't think you were either. Uh, and, and class clowns are, are fine, funny folks. Um, a lot of them have great <laughs> careers in comedy. Um, but I use comedy. Uh, comedy was how I spoke because otherwise I was silent. And that's what I say about this too. So it sometimes can hinder you in the real world. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, for myself, I a friend called me out of like, after he had been on Obsessed, he was like, wait, you interview people in real life sometimes. <laughs> 
Yes. Yes. And it's 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 true. Sometimes, like, I want this uh, conversation to go well. I want to, uh, you know, sometimes you bring up something about yourself and you can see somebody's eyes glaze over and like, well, okay, I'm shifting to interview mode then. And this mm-hmm. conversation will be about you. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so good and bad. Uh, so I, I want to ask you about radio specifically, not broadcasting, but radio. Uh, mm-hmm. The radio is something that used to connect us. And I'm trying not to talk about films. There are a couple films. You already mentioned one of them uh, that use radio as like this uh, unifying force <laughs> mm-hmm. floating mysteriously through the air but the power of us all kind of we're all going about our different things but if we're listening to the same radio station listening to the same dj we're still kind of connected Mm -hmm. um do you think radio still in its modern form do you think it still provides that or do you think that is a time that has passed when there are only three radio stations and if you checked into anyone in los angeles in 1969, they were listening to one of, you know, three, four, five stations. How do you feel I, about that? I think it has passed. I think it has passed. However, there are examples of in pockets, it's pretty powerful and it's still present. Uh, there's some big morning shows in L.A. Um, the Heidi and Frank show, uh, our buddy Mark Ellis is on there all the time. It's very powerful. And it's bigger than people would think. There's another morning show in L.A. that's the number one rated morning show. Uh, a friend of Mark's and I is the producer over there. I had never heard of it. Mm. <laughs> he was like, oh, mm. she's over. At, I think it's got the Woody show. I'm like, what are you? What? He's like, it's like the biggest show in the world in L.A. And it <laughs> is. It is. It exists. It exists. Radio stations um, haven't gone away yet. And I think we still now I sound now I do sound like a Ken Burns doc. I think we still crave that intimacy because that was when the ability to finally live stream when Meerkat shows up on our phones for the two weeks that Meerkat was the most powerful new app on our phones and then Periscope. And then the ability to go live on Instagram, the live on when the ability to go live speaks to that. It's not always mm-hmm. you uh, correctly it's 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 not fully harnessed at times youtube all that stuff live streaming twitch it's a reason that works and 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 even why well, might not might disagree with how people present themselves on say twitch or something like that but you cannot deny the power of it it is absolutely speaks to that that timeless thing of we're all gathered around the radio listening to an address listening to the, the world happen at the same time. And, and it, it's never going to be the same. Like I, 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 I'm a big sports fan who doesn't watch sports as much anymore because I just don't know how to watch it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have channel two, four, 12 or whatever to look. I, I was, I was um, fascinated by um, this moment in, in the Ken Burns Vietnam doc, where this is the, the speech in which LBJ um, announces he's not going to run. Um, in, in, in 68 and in early in 68, uh, Bobby Kennedy's, uh, um, been shot and the, the war, the Tet offensive has changed everything. It's complete chaos. They can no longer contain the lies. And, and, and there's this moment where it's like, they say Lyndon Baines Johnson shocked the world. Mm. And I was like, I don't know if that happens anymore. Um, I don't know if we all gather around because, um, everything stops. He asked for time on the networks and you still get that, but we're not gathered around the same thing anymore. Uh, yeah. You would hear it the next day on YouTube or you'd get a your Facebook live clip or, you know, someone put on reels or someone making fun of it on TikTok. And, and I still think we crave that. I still think it exists. This stuff that we're at talking about now, it's still, it, it's trying to get back to that. And it's part, it's the new version of it. You'll never get back the way it was. No. And, and like with all change, there's, there's, good and bad. And I think about the change so much of, uh, I think our generation and generations previous to us, uh, suffered and struggled with the, uh, with limits of mm-hmm. th- there are only this many, you know, uh, sources of information and we don't right. get to hear other voices or we don't get other options. And I, so I think there's this great beauty in, in options and, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm not a super expert in, in Spotify and the damage to radio stations and all that. But I do see the value of things like everybody makes their own playlist and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you curate what you love and you can find weirder things and obscure things. And uh, you can share them within a smaller, more intimate group and bring that group closer together. So I think having 
the ability to, you know, as we were bombarded with for a brief time with the Burger King ad, <laughs> make it your way. Your way yeah. So much that that was where everybody pivoted to. Like, that's where money is going to be making it your own way. So we got to make everything you decide, make it your own mm-hmm. way. The entire world is a choose your own adventure. And there is, you can express yourself. You can shape stuff. You have more options. That's all great. Mm-hmm. But then the other side of that is, I think there are, there are times and moments where people are craving not to have options limited, to have them limited. But when options are limited, that forces us all, like in mm-hmm. days of radio, like to have this, we're all having the same soundtrack today. Cause it's the one of three that's available. Yeah. And I, we, we were talking on our social media episode about what is needed is what, what the site formerly known as Twitter used to have, which is absolutely not algorithmic controlled. We are all responding to whatever is happening in the world right now. If it's a big deal, if it's a mm-hmm. joke, if a llama escaped, <laughs> mm-hmm. we're mm-hmm. all focusing on that together and i think both are good the need to totally yes. uh, have it your way and and shape your world and find the voices and the songs that you need and that you want we need that but then we also do just need times where like we're all listening and experiencing to the same thing yeah yeah there's there's always something gained uh, always something lost and i think that we we have to find the best way forward between it all you, you're speaking some great stuff here um um uh, the, the 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 social media thing of 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 a llama's running loose. What what color is that dress? Also, there's an earthquake. Also, there's a, a civil unrest. It, that that is the same feeling, and we all gathered around it mostly because not everyone uses that stuff, or some are late adapters. But that's what's missing now more than ever, and that's the danger. You, you mean, like I I um even despite being not just a radio fan but a music fan, like the the album died 20 years ago, and it's a shame. Because an album is 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 a communication. It's nine to thirteen tracks of communication uh, of, from an artist or artists to the world, and that used to mean something. And 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 it, it it just became different. But at the same time, I got you know rock and roll as we know it or we knew it is dead. Yeah, but I got get all the time. The, the whole you've mentioned it like the ah, music ain't as rock music ain't as good as it used to be. BS. There's so many wonderful artists out there right now. I play them every week. There's bands that you can discover that would not normally break through. They would not have been uh, pushed by the A&R guy. They would have not have been pushed by the level, but they can mm. get their music out there and you can find them and you've, and, and one leads to another. That's when, uh, that's a victory of the alg- algorithm for me. Mm. Uh, there's a band living more that I became a fan of. They have this great radio single called Sharp. It's, 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 it's reminiscent of Blondie, but it's very unique to themselves. Spencer Livingston and Alex Moore. And, uh, from there, I discovered the span child scene. From there, I discovered Kath Myers. From there, I discovered Jesse Pay and Pom Poms, and, and every and, and they're all in the same. And and I would not that n- would not have happened in the old days. No, I never have discovered it. But then the problem is uh, these artists can't survive because those that that wonderful new technology is now in the hands of companies that are like great at ours. And how does it how does it profit? Uh, how does it make profit for us, not them? And so that's the other danger in another discussion. But that that's. You know, but 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 radio could could represent that. Radio was like I keep I always tell the story uh, around the time I started my radio career, we were all gathered around listening to Alanis Morissette, mm. like and and a new single from Alanis from the album. Even though you already own Jagged Little Pill, a new single was a thing. It was an event. Mm. Go to the sixties of of July sixty seven. Sergeant Pepper comes out. We we it's it's is gathered around. You were gathered around it, and I think we lose that. Where, where it's a little, that's part of what we lose versus what we gain. Yeah. I mean, it still exists. Like, you know, uh, exactly. we, yeah, the midnight group listens on social media to, to mm-hmm. Taylor's new album, you know, yes. that kind she, of thing. Yeah. You know? She's amazing for that right now. Look at the experience. SoFi Stadium. <sighs> no, I, I, I uh, Some people, I wish I was there because, because I'm opened up for her and, and, and I, would, I actually really, really respect Taylor Swift. Uh, every person I know who was at the concert says you cannot believe how loud it was. It was record setting in the volume of, of <laughs> the fans experiencing this all at once. Um, yeah. Pretty powerful. Yeah. And we got to experiment with that with the Gaga concert, but yeah, I, mm-hmm. I, my plane came over the SoFi stadium and I wanted to be able to just parachute down <laughs> <laughs> and be, be a part of that. So yeah, no, I take what you mean. I think for me, it just, I, I kind of, I grew up with, with rock and roll. It was, it was important to my dad. It was important to me. And then over my years, uh, I, 
there, I have different pockets where I would tune, where I'd be like, I need to know what's going on. And I tune back into music. And like, that's mm-hmm. when I discovered Gaga. And like, I, mm-hmm. around, you know, uh, 2008, 2010, I was listening to the, to the radio. And mm-hmm. it was, it was a mix of, uh, more artsy experimental pop like like gaga to hip hop to you know a, a couple still kind of uh rock songs and then i don't know maybe like 2016 2017 is like i gotta tune back in because i'm totally out of it now i was like mm-hmm. had that window like i know what the kids are talking about today hey how about yeah. that kesha and people would be like uh you, yeah. you should really go google what's going on and i was like i realized like oh, it's i'm i'm out of it again yeah. Yeah. and when i tuned back in it, it was there just there wasn't any in, there wasn't anything that I recognized as rock and roll on mm-hmm. pop mm-hmm. stations. And that, right. that to me was never a, there's no good rock and roll or rock and roll is dead. It, but it was like, wow, there's mm-hmm. not a single thing with like just a solid, you know, mm-hmm. rock beat, a guitar, a bass drums on popular radio was a big shift for me. Yeah, no, no, and that, and that's uh, yeah, and that even speaks to genre shifts, right? When the, mm-hmm. the new metal of the early two thousands is something I'll, I'll never really enjoy. I have to respect <laughs> their audiences and what they've done, and you know, I'm friends with Eric from Shinedown, and and uh, they have such a strong community around them. I, I you know, the, their music's not necessarily my favorite, but Eric is so talented, and he does music outside of the band that I'm like, what do more of that (laughs) and do more of that. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you have to, you have to respect what these artists doing, but yeah, yeah, that, that's the problem where what you hear, you get so, yeah, the, the, what is presented for money um, is, is sometimes the problem too. Yeah. Yeah. But, but great stuff about how the algorithm can help you dive in and find what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, If the opportunity presented itself now, you've got broadcast in your life in lots of different ways and you you have a mastery of various uh, uh, technologies that you can, you could do that. You're, you're, you're DJing again, right? You've got this show. Um, uh, I'm going to ask the rest of my question, but I want you to do a plug for what is it you're doing and what state is it in? (laughs) Oh, well, yeah. So I am on a radio station called Hall of Fame Music Radio. It's in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a small radio station. I mean, I, I, I don't mind saying it. I literally make no money doing it. Um, but it's, you know, you can listen to it through their website, hofmradio.com, which if you go to the website, you're going to laugh because you're like, did a 72-year-old former DJ make this website? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but it's great. And I, lo- and I love doing it. And it's straightforward uh, disc jockeying, right? You are <laughs> you are picking yeah. thing, picking songs and spinning them and, and chatting I, in between? I, I don't even have that control. It's a, it's a computer generated thing. I can switch the songs out now. Initially I couldn't, but even then I can only, it's only I can go through what they have in the library, which, which is uh, many, many songs in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s and into the 90s. Um, but yeah, I'm not doing anything ov- ov- overly creative. I'm just having fun having 10 seconds to talk. Okay. And, and, yeah. and cue up the next song. Yeah. And, and you know, literally I, I go a little bit longer, uh, 25, 30 seconds at times. And I never get my, my program director never criticizes me because I think I can do it in a way that, that keeps people engaged. But, uh, he always reminds us, sends emails out. You got 10 seconds. You got 10 seconds to I, ID the song, the station, tell me a fact and set up the next song. <laughs> uh, I love the thought of people just uh, speed facting. <laughs> uh, has a scar on her left bicep. Anyway, here we go. Yeah. Um, and it's fun and that's part of broadcasting too absolutely yeah uh so you've got you've got broadcasting in your life in lots of different ways but if the opportunity presented itself if somebody heard this podcast from like one of the major stations in los angeles and was like we got an opening do you want to come up to the major leagues of broadcasting is that something you would even want to do now or have has your life moved on there's a chance i i, I would I, I the answer is no and uh, to explain so um couple radio stations there's one big radio station in la that their morning show host left and retired or whatever and i would go into linkedin or get the emails from linkedin they were looking for the morning show host replacements for a long time Mm. and i would see the ad and 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 i applied there was one i did apply for one station a weekend uh, you know shift didn't didn't get it never heard back i don't know what happened but like and i I, and it was this weird it's i asked myself that question like oh okay what if I was to get it? I don't know if I would. They probably go for some bigger name, blah, blah, blah. What doesn't matter? What if I was to try? What if I was to get it? And then I ran through getting up at three in the morning, <laughs> Monday through Friday, 
it would affect, you know, force center. We, we can move you, you and Jen will probably accommodate. Yay. Great. Um, travel, everything. Next, you know, I'm working a full-time job and, and that's not where I'm at emotionally a shift doing things. I, I maybe have to get a little bit more structured in my life. Maybe I'm too in love with my, uh, free form existence. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had, I had to really ask myself that. Um, cause I, I feel as though the itch is being scratched in other places, broadcasting wise, four center pop rock and radio, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, a, I'm about to do more pop rock and radio. I'm, I'm about to syndicate the show, hopefully. Um, and, and it's, so I'm like, ah, I wouldn't. And there's uh, another friend of mine got, uh, there was a potential offer for him to go start a morning show in another state in a city that I did not believe had fun. I, I don't think fun is legally allowed in the city. Um, <laughs> I'll let you all guess on which one. Uh, and he was like, Hey man, if I go, what are you doing? And you know, it would have been a bigger question for Grace and I, but like, uh, I, same thing. I was like, Oh, that sounds fun for about two months. <laughs> yeah. Well, this makes a lot of sense to me that it, once one is so lucky to carve out a little bit of a, of a schedule that has not just flexibility for schedule, but creative flexibility of like, if you want to mm-hmm. stop doing one podcast, you can just start doing another. Um, and it mm-hmm. obviously it comes with it with the, with risks. See our plugs at the top for <laughs> ongoing <laughs> Patreon support. Is, and we, we, we do not stand atop the world, uh, you know, triumphant. There are downsides to it. But once you have that taste of, of freedom, honestly, Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. I, I love that our conversation is coming back to that story I told about the animator Bill Plimpton. Of this yep. is kind of your version of if yep. the person with the briefcase came and said a million dollars to make your childhood dream come true, and you had an epiphany of like, actually, I did it my own way. Thanks for the mm-hmm. offer, but no. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, th- that's a great. I'm going to look more into his his personal story. I, I th- absolutely think again. I want to make money. I want to survive. I, I wish more of it happened. I, I there was a time. Uh, uh, last two years where I realized um, I was had a radio shift. I was back on the air at Hall of Fame Music Radio, which is totally fun, even though it's in my, you know, house. I, 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 my shift is Saturday morning, East Coast time. So by the time I wake up, I'm already on the air. But there's a couple of times I'm able to go to the app. You can tune in radio app, all that kind of stuff. And I can hear myself. And it's a blast. You know, and it's totally me doing, you know, that was Jody Mitchell. Uh, now we got this one coming. And it's totally, you know, not super personality based, but it's, 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 it's fun. I was doing the Saturday night nap sock, which was literally, literally what I did at 14. Just now to a, a little bit of a larger audience that I was slowly losing as I took on Trump and all that stuff. But like, I, I had this epiphany of like, I am doing what I wanted to do. I am doing what I set out in what I was doing in my room at 14 and thought, wouldn't this be great if this was my life? Mm. And I was doing it. And, and, and unfortunately you don't always make money doing that. And unfortunately we still need money <laughs> to, yeah. to do that. And I like money. Money's nice. Um, uh, it can be exchanged for goods and services as Homer learned. Um, <laughs> but I had that moment, not quite the, no, no man with a briefcase offered me things yet. Um, but there's something that's pretty powerful when you get to that moment. Yeah, it really is. I realized you should also plug exactly what pop rock and radio is. Cause I admit, I don't understand what medium you're using where you can play <laughs> songs without getting into any sort of legal. Uh, yeah. Tie-ups. Which by the way, I want to talk about change my rant on that. Um, um, all the songwriting unions and stuff. I don't know if they're getting better. YouTube, Twitch, everything's pushed it. I, I'm in the course of, hopefully later this year releasing some music. So I'm in the middle of BMI and ASCAP right now. Uh, it's a shame that they have not found a way to license music for podcasts. I would 15 years ago, that's what I would have started as a music podcast. Mm-hmm. They didn't do that. And my friend, my former radio partner, one time he wanted to do one for, he wanted a Sinatra and a swing show. Like, and he, and mm. he this is the old, this is about 10, 15 years ago. So he called them. People actually used to do that. He called them. It was like, I will pay you a couple thousand dollars a year for the license and they say we, we were not going to do that mm. and, and i don't know why maybe it'll change but anyways pop rock and radio is on something called mixed cloud another former radio partner of mine tom was a show on there called third place radio it was the first ever podcast that interviewed me in 2010 or 11 um he i ran into him in a show in seattle it was like I, I was having this exact conversation with him that you and i are having where i'm like i miss 
the music side of it. And he was like, oh, go to Mixcloud. And you sign up and it's a British based company. They, you, they, they, they pay the artists. I do not know how or why. And maybe we uncover that it's, this, but, <laughs> but I get to play whatever I want. So they and, have like an overall license, that company, yeah. and you can use anything yeah. that they have a license to. Yes. And it's not okay. unlike, you know, Instagram, uh, you can play songs now. Right. And they, and that's part of royalties, BMI, ASCAP, Sound Exchange, go collect those kind of mechanical royalties and everything for songwriters and performers. So it's getting to the point where it's okay and you can do it. Um, and, 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 and we are for years, we're on anchor anchor bought by Spotify. Finally, after all these years, um, Spotify for podcasters, they allow, you can do music on Spotify, so Nick from Thank the Manker, who of course is 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 a rock and roll star himself, he has a something called the Radio Radio Show that I listen to every now and then, and it's on Spotify. But it has to stay on Spotify, yeah. And, and that's the only way to make it good. But Mixcloud, it's not. And so I do a, mostly live every Saturday night, a live a two hour live uh, music show, um, and then I'll record some episodes and all kind of stuff. Nice. Uh, and they have a pretty deep bench of uh, of songs for you to choose from. Then no, it's whatever I do. So a lot of I play from Spotify. And nice. just play the songs and, and, and then you, you, you do track list later and that kind of stuff. But yeah, if, if you have all your files on your computer, you know, you could do however, you, however you get the songs out. Okay. Uh, Cause I'm really looking forward to uh, possibly doing some other center, you know, shows about music. And I think we'll just mm -hmm. have to like pause and say, and I'll go listen to the song on your own. Cause we can't really just <laughs> yeah. put the song in, you know? Yeah, no, it is, it is a bummer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I got one more question for you and ending on a, uh, hopefully a, a fun question. Uh, mm, uh, whoops. Uh, it's, I meant it to be fun, but it's kind of deep. Uh, if you could broadcast to the entire world for one hour and literally everyone in the world had to listen, what would you broadcast? I, I would. Um, oh, man. Hmm. Because I kind of want it to be music because I feel that's the most powerful connective thread, right? It's an easier way to connect with people. Mm -hmm. but I think based on, on what I do now and what we talk about now, I, I, I think my big, um, my big drive in life is to, is to, uh, is to I, I, you know, I talk an hour about what this all means and why, what it says about us, mm -hmm. this meaning pop culture, art, why it's so powerful, the politics of it, what's there, what's it saying about us, what, did, what does it say about you? how you read it, not necessarily bad. Um, like how do you read it? How do you take it? Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, and media literacy is a buzzword that sometimes has negative connotations, but it's pretty powerful and pretty important and pretty, um, I, I just think something we need to understand even more and more because it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, there's a presidential candidate who just recently said, um, Oh, I love watching field of dreams with my kids. Uh, a big subplot of that movie is book, book banning. <laughs> And, and this is a guy currently banning books in his state. And it's like, how do you do that? Do you mm -hmm. disconnect? Do you not see it? Do you just not pick up on it? You just see it as fluff as a movie and nothing more. And that's the danger of it. And that's why when we talk about these things and why it's a bummer, we can't go in as depth uh, and as deep as we, we do uh, on talking about the Star Wars stuff is, is, is it means everything. And that's what I would do. And it wouldn't be as fun. It wouldn't be as jokey, but that's what I want the world to hear. Yeah. Well, if you'd, if you'd share your, your hour long broadcast to the entire world, uh, I would definitely, uh, join you in that and make sure that we throw in a few jokes you on there, keep it to an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah. Uh, totally agreed. And hopefully we can keep, um, pursuing that, that way of, of thinking that, that the surface joys, uh, the, the delight of hearing a, a, a beat that that makes you tap your foot seeing you know a, a film that just thrills you and makes you laugh that that those initial reactions are valuable and meaningful but they aren't the entire experience that mm -hmm. there's a reason that we're responding and to to hold up art as a uh, multi-layered and multifaceted and to be take just like a little bit of a you know, I'm not saying you have to write an essay about every song you ever like, um, but, you know, to to accept them, accept and believe that art is multilayered and and, and uh, multifaceted. And you don't have to engage with it that way all the time, but to accept that that is the truth of art, I think, is really yeah. important to me. I think it is. I think it is. And, and, you know, we, we, we'll probably get to that here, but yeah. <laughs> I think we will. All right. Well, that was a the the siren song of radio is what I called that episode. Ken can call it whatever he wants when he uh, puts it up on That's the good. old podcast feeds. But uh, this has been really great fun. 
uh, to interview, uh, got into a little bit of conversations. I shared some thoughts too, but really interview you on your, your journey and what you got out of the world of broadcasting. That is it. Do you want to let people know where they can find us? Yes, absolutely. We're on social media, of course. Uh, no matter what you call it, we're at Twitter X. We're there at Force Center Pod. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram as well. We are on Threads at Force Center Pod as well. Uh, look us up there. I f- think I figured out how to get back into there so I can post again. <laughs> so it's all right. Uh, we're on YouTube as well. Still there. Still rebroadcasting episodes. And uh, when the time is right, uh, we'll be back on YouTube in a uh, even bigger way. Uh, this month uh, are, are, are going forward. So uh, subscribe over there if you will. Uh, you can uh, get merch at tpublic.com slash user slash force center. Find us wherever uh, you can find podcasts. Just search. You'll find us. And again, as we said up top, if you'd like to support us directly, patreon.com slash force center is where you can do so and uh, get into that discord and still have a chance to discuss your favorite comfort foods. Yeah, and you can get in there now and you can uh, discuss your your favorite songs uh, from 1996 that Ken knows and I don't. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Most likely it's going to be In in the Meantime by Space Hawk. That's usually what people will say. Oh, I can't wait. Can't wait to give that one a listen. Uh, You can find me on on all the various social media threads in Blue Sky in particular. I'm trying to spend some time on my handle everywhere is at Joseph Scrimshaw and got some uh, more fun short film news coming up very soon. Ken, did you plug yourself? Um, uh, I did, but also in terms of social media, uh, yes, uh, we can, um, <laughs> just follow me at Ken Napsock. Go to my website, KenNapsock.com. It's a one-stop shop. Member website, uh, it's still pretty valuable to just one-stop shop all the things I do. And from there, you can link to Pop Rock and Radio if you want to hear some music. That is great. And for now, we're going to stop talking so you all can go listen to the radio in whatever way it works for you. That is it. Oh, yeah. Yeah.